A pickaxe shatters the rocky wall of a mine shaft hundreds of feet below the earth. It's 1871, in a place that will later be known as Columbia County, Pennsylvania. Men performing backbreaking labor, their hands and faces blackened with dirt, all working in pursuit of that immensely valuable rock, coal. It's the fuel for the booming industrial revolution, and much like how dragons were said to guard gold, this more modern treasure pointed to an even more terrifying monster. A monster that the SCP Foundation would someday come to know as SCP-1179. But these unfortunate and underpaid miners had no idea what they were about to discover. One of the men working there that day, Rob O'Dwyer, was hammering away at the wall in front of him when he heard something strange. Was that an echo behind the rocks? This could mean only one thing. The rocks in front of them were hollow. There had to be some kind of space hiding behind them. O'Dwyer struck again and again at the rocks in front of him until the barrier finally tumbled away. He and the other miners suddenly felt a gust of cool, ancient air from the vast and darkened cavern in front of them sweep through the mine. They felt like they were standing on the edge of something truly otherworldly. As they lifted their safety lamps high and crept carefully into the dark, it dawned on them that they were likely the first human beings to ever set foot here, but that didn't mean something non-human hadn't gotten there first. O'Dwyer's lamp soon found something in the dark. A huge figure curled into a crouching position hiding its face. It was made from stone, like an enormous yet incredibly detailed statue of something almost human, but not quite. The petrified thing had two great horns on either side of its head, twisting into spirals like that of a huge ram. Word of the giant frozen monster hidden in the bottom of the mine soon made its way back to the foreman, and then back to the mine's owner, one Sean O'Malley. If it were anyone else, perhaps this news would have been taken to the press immediately, and the Foundation would have taken control of the situation just as quickly. But Mr. O'Malley was no ordinary mining magnate. He was a member of the Molly Maguires, an Irish-American secret society whose members were predominantly coal miners in Pennsylvania. Sean and the other Molly Maguires dubbed this anomaly the Sleeping Stone Giant and conspired to keep it a secret between them, as secret societies have a habit of doing. Though the Molly Maguires were disbanded less than a decade later, they were all sworn to secrecy on the giant's resting place. Until, of course, a descendant of Sean O'Malley, his grandson Ian O'Malley, was chosen as a prospective agent of the SCP Foundation. The Foundation doesn't just let anyone join their ranks. They perform an extensive background check on all prospective agents, both to find out that they're capable of rising to the challenges of the job, and also to detect any affiliation to enemy groups of interest. It was during this background check that O'Malley's subterranean family secret was discovered, and the land above the old mine shaft was bought up by a front company owned by the Foundation. The Sleeping Stone Giant was finally in capable hands, and in keeping with standard procedure, a research site was built above the giant to gather data and keep an eye on things. At the time, the anomaly was considered extremely low risk. Its containment file read, SCP-1179 is apparently dormant, encased in the bedrock under research site. Apart from simple monitoring and standard research safety protocols, no additional containment is deemed necessary at this time. But of course, those simple containment procedures would soon need updating. In 1962, the town of Centralia, Pennsylvania had a trash problem. There were eight illegal trash dumping sites across the town, and to combat this issue, the town council opened up a huge landfill in an abandoned mine shaft. You'd think this would be enough for the moderately sized town, but humans have a tendency to produce a lot of trash, and they soon filled up the new landfill too. In order to address the issue, the town decided to do a controlled burn of some of the garbage. It should have been simple enough. But those who lit this garbage fire didn't follow proper safety procedures and ended up accidentally igniting a seam of anthracite coal. This was like lighting the fuse to the world's largest stick of dynamite, and fire soon coursed through the long abandoned mine tunnels. When the fireball finally reached the sleeping stone giant in his dark pit, the beast woke up. In that instant, an otherwise uneventful day quickly became a brutal bloodbath. Researchers walking through the base felt a monstrous rumbling beneath them. Heat sensors were burning up and seismic readings were off the scale. Something was climbing up towards them, 
Suddenly, an impossibly large sword speared its way out of the floor, killing everyone around it with an immense blast of heat. The newly awakened monster went on an underground rampage, almost completely destroying the research base and killing nearly everyone inside, before retreating into the honeycomb of coal mines and caverns in the area, igniting even more anthracite coal fires. The Foundation needed to step in before things really got out of control. At present, the Foundation couldn't properly administer standard area construction protocols for Keter Class SCPs, so they instead designated the mines, caverns, and surrounding countryside as Area 179, and dispatched mobile task forces to try and contain the beasts rampaging in the Centralia mines. But much like the fire that started this whole mess, the beast proved much harder to control than initially imagined. All five of the expeditionary teams sent to apprehend the monster failed, and many team members were slaughtered in the process. From the terrifying accounts of the survivors, we have a vague idea of the nature of the beast below. No pictures of the creature exist and exact descriptions on the beast can vary. Whether this is because the beast frequently shapeshifts or because it has some kind of cognitohazardous effects on those who view it is unclear. The most frequently reported characteristics of the creature are its immense height and the extreme heat that its body exudes. Many report that the creature's body seemed to be formed of a mix of hardened lava, pure fire, and burning smoke. The beast measures over 30 meters from head to toe, with shoulders over 8 meters wide. It's commonly said to have two huge ram-like horns and a weathered, bearded face. The beast has been compared by some to the Norse mythological figure Sirtur, the giant guarding the frontier of the Norse fire realm of Muspel. However, the actual age of the creature seems to predate these legends by a considerable margin. Dating of the stratum encasing SCP-1179 indicates it dates to the Mississippian subperiod of the Carboniferous period, approximately 359.2 to 318.1 million years ago. This age is consistent with the geological age of this region, so it may have literally come with the territory. Less common descriptions of the beast claim that it has huge wings, eyes made of hellfire, and fangs as long as a man's arm. Some say that the beast has neither horns nor fangs, and its face is encircled by flames which reach down into a long beard of fire. And like a certain creature known as the Balrog that Lord of the Rings fans will be very familiar with, this beast comes with weapons. In one hand, the beast wields a giant burning sword around 5 meters in length, in the other, it wields a huge, multi-tailed whip made out of fire. It's incredibly proficient with these weapons, too, and has a serious strategic advantage in its underground environment. Foundation researchers have determined that some of the wounds the beast gained from its first confrontation haven't fully healed, implying the beast could, in theory, be destroyed with enough firepower. However, given that the beast has killed almost everyone who faced it, and its mere presence can start almost uncontrollable fires, direct engagement would only be used as a last resort. Even the creature's breath can be extremely dangerous. Chemical analysis of air samples taken from SCP-1179's breath have shown exceptionally high concentrations of carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide. The very presence of this creature creates a real and active danger to everyone around it and the beast's presence was beginning to have seriously negative effects on the people up above. By the 1970s, the Foundation had given up on sending mobile task forces into the caverns, and instead began to focus on depopulating the town of Centralia to prevent further fatalities from the presence of SCP-1179. The subterranean activities of the creature were causing collapses in some areas, and noxious fumes were beginning to rise up from cracks in the ground. As the constant raging fires burned beneath the earth, they were causing everything above to slowly melt or bake. A Foundation geologist determined that the fires created by the beast would likely remain active for 250 years, and any attempts to put out the fires or contain the beast would ultimately be futile. This led to the formation of Project Tartarus, a concerted effort to cover up SCP-1179 and fully evacuate the citizens of Centralia. 
They pushed the narrative that the mine fires, while deadly, were merely the result of the failed garbage burning plan, and little by little the people of Centralia began to move away. By 1984, the United States government finally caved to secret lobbying from the Foundation, and allocated funds in excess of $42 million to relocate the remaining civilian residents from the area. Any legal complaints from Centralia residents were quietly crushed by the Foundation, and efforts to remove pretty much all residents from the area were successful. This allowed the Foundation to finally cast a wider net and administer Kettier-class containment protocols around the two-kilometer underground zone where SCP-1179 resides. The Foundation has continued studies on the beast from below in the decades since, with some scientists even suggesting it could be used to produce geothermal energy, but whether or not that would actually be feasible remains unknown. For now, SCP-1179 seems content to stay within its zone, and hopefully it stays that way. But as we're forced to dig deeper and deeper for the remaining precious metals here on Earth, there's no telling what new dangers we might find lurking far below the ground. It was the summer of 2012 in Damascus, and for the people of Syria, it certainly seemed like all the predictions about the end of the world were coming true. The Syrian civil war was raging between multiple rebel groups, and the dictator Bashar al-Assad, whose government was shelling its own people, as well as using chemical weapons and brutal campaigns of violence across the country in hopes of quelling the rebellion. Little did they know, amidst all this pain and bloodshed, something even more dangerous was brewing. An anomalous phenomenon in the sunny plains north of Damascus that may pose a threat to all of humanity someday. A threat known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-3989, the Bone Orchard. This temporal and spatial anomaly was discovered a few years earlier in 2009, before the Syrian civil war even officially began. It's strange for a highly dangerous Keter-class anomaly to be discovered under such seemingly mundane circumstances. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-3989 after a small olive orchard owner sold a strangely high amount of olives that shouldn't have been possible when compared to his reported number of Olea Europea olive trees. Field agents were dispatched to question the owner about his sudden success, but he was resistant to questioning. The agents began a covert surveillance operation to figure out what was actually going on here, at which point they discovered a considerable spatial anomaly. The olive orchard was far bigger on the inside. The property was seized by the foundation for containment. The owner had no real knowledge of the spatial anomaly. It's likely he just decided not to look a gift horse in the mouth while making money hand over fist from the extra olives he sold. The owner was given amnestics and a new life, as the Foundation began to study this anomaly, which was now labeled SCP-3989. To this day, no researcher has been able to figure out the origin of 3989's anomalous qualities. It was first given a Euclid-class designation and cordoned off from the public with a simple chain-link fence while Foundation investigations were underway on the inside. On a map, the plot of land the olive farm should occupy is about five square acres, but this plot contains an unseen portal to a pocket dimension within its 12-meter active zone, which doesn't follow the same spatial laws that our reality does. This subdimension, known as SCP-3989-A, is a hotbed of fascinating anomalous activity. Upon discovery of this hot zone, the Foundation established the nearby Area 126 as a research center and a makeshift containment facility for any anomalous entities captured from SCP-3989-A. It seemed like the Foundation really had a handle on this situation, but they were blissfully unaware of the true horrors lurking within SCP-3989-A. But they'd soon find out in the most horrifying way possible. Dr. Farah Kazeli was assigned to head the research into the anomalous zone within 3989, and naturally, he began organizing fact-finding expeditions into the heart of the affected area. The first guinea pig to head into the hot zone was former Foundation agent Hosiah Herrick, who'd been demoted to the lowly D-class position of D-126-15 due to failures on a previous mission. With a remote link to Dr. Gazelli, Herrick was forced to venture into the active anomalous zone to collect footage and samples of the flora and fauna within. The first thing Herrick noticed on his expedition was the strange quality of the olive trees within the active zone. The bark was a stark white, and the leaves a bloody red. 
Up close, Hera could see that the trunks and branches of the trees had undergone a process known as ossification, where the material slowly becomes bone or bone-like tissue. Hence the anomaly's creepy name, the Bone Orchard. These ossified trees became known as SCP-3989-1. Herrick also made another discovery. All over the trees and ground were worm-like creatures that looked like long maggots that the Foundation dubbed SCP-3989-1A. Agent Herrick then noticed something was off about the leaves of the ossified trees. They were beating. He looked closer and they appeared to be heart tissue filled with pumping veins. Dr. Gazelli ordered Herrick to take a branch for testing, and when he did, the tree began to bleed. When he looked down, he saw that the worm-like creatures that covered the ground were now crawling up his legs. Ignoring orders from Dr. Gazelli, Herrick fled from the active zone in terror. As he left, Dr. Gazelli caught something in the corner of Herrick's body cam footage, a long white hind limb disappearing behind a tree. Back in our normal dimension, Tests on the sample Herrick collected yielded more upsetting discoveries. Genetically, the trees were identical to humans, the trunks were human bone, and the leaves really were made of human heart tissue. Fascinated and just a little bit horrified, Dr. Gazelli authorized further expeditions into 3989-A. This time, though, Agent Herrick would be accompanied by another D-Class, and both would be armed with handguns and protective body armor. As it would turn out, this expedition would be even more horrifying than the first. As the two D-Classes explored the active zones to collect further samples, they found that the worms were responsible for the ossification of the otherwise non-anomalous olive trees. They consumed the wood little by little and deposited human bone matter in return. Herrick and his companion also noticed that these trees were beginning to bear fruit. Dr. Gazelli ordered Herrick to collect some of this fruit for testing, but when they attempted to remove the fruit, it burst, releasing more worm creatures. It seemed that the converted trees acted as incubators for their egg sacs. Before the duo could return with the samples they were able to take, the creature that had been spotted on Herrick's body cam during the first mission finally appeared. It was huge, with long white limbs, and no facial features except for a huge mouth. It grabbed Herrick's companion and literally ate the top half of his body in a single bite before dropping his legs to the ground. This horrifying beast, and the many others like it, would later be designated as SCP-3989-2A. Herrick pulled out his sidearm and shot the creature several times. The creature ignored the bullets, though, and charged Herrick. The feed from his body cam cut out soon after. Both men were declared killed in action, and in recognition of his sacrifice, Josiah Herrick was posthumously reinstated to his old position in the Foundation. Job well done, Agent. Dr. Gazelli, meanwhile, prepared for the next mission. This time knowing of the clear dangers present within the Bone Orchard, Dr. Gazelli recruited the help of MTF Zeta-9, aka the Mole Rats. Three members, referred to as Charlie Team, were sent into the anomalous zone, once again remotely directed by Dr. Gazelli. They were equipped with experimental ultrasound technology, so they could scan the fruit of the trees within 3989-A without breaking any and incurring the wrath of 3989-2A, which seemed to act as sentries for the trees. Early on in their journey, they found the body of Agent Herrick crucified against one of the ossified trees, his skin covered in mysterious symbols that were likely of Sarkic origin. While we don't have time to fully explore Sarkicism, that will require a video explanation all of its own. All you need to know is that it's a dangerous religious cult that worships flesh and disease and has close ties to similar dangerous anomalies, like SCP-610, also known as the flesh that hates. People familiar with that SCP will note eerily strange similarities to some of the things the mole rats were about to encounter. As Charlie team explored, they saw a huge number of 3989-2As observing them with eyeless faces from between the ossified trees. They pressed on, until they discovered what seemed to be an entirely new kind of tree within the bone orchard. SCP-3989-2 were huge trees made out of what appears to be enlarged human spines in place of a trunk. The smaller twigs on the tree were made from heart and lung tissue and the whole thing was covered in what appeared to be human amniotic sacs. Charlie team attempted to use their ultrasound scanners to discover the contents of these sacs, but one of them exploded in the process, 
releasing an entirely new variety of monster. From the sacks emerged the larval stage of SCP-3989-2B, smaller humanoid monsters with no faces, no sensory organs, two pelvises, four legs, and an exposed spine. Suddenly, Charlie team could feel a horrifying psychic presence around them, which one member of the team described as being like someone grabbing her liver and giggling in her face. As the various monsters of the Bone Orchard began to converge on the team, the voice of the Sarkic prophet of war and the hunt, Oruk, began sounding in their ears. He was beckoning them to join him. While Charlie team fled from the active zone, Dr. Gazelli felt increasingly drawn into it. He heard the voice of Oruk, and he liked what he heard. Little by little, the workers of Area 126 were losing their minds, manipulated by the sarkic power of the Bone Orchard right next to them, day after day. They were no longer loyal to the Foundation. They wanted to serve their new Dark Masters. The fourth and final expedition was led by Dr. Gazelli himself. He took a band of loyal followers and one non-believer on a quest into the active zone to find an Orkian temple they believed was hidden in the very heart of the Bone Orchard. Once they were inside, Gazelli and his loyalists murdered the non-believer as a sacrifice to their new master. They carried on until they eventually found what they were looking for. A giant stone temple resembling an Aztec ziggurat, dubbed SCP-3989-4. There they also encountered a new kind of monster, dubbed SCP-3989-3. These beasts were larger than the others, and resembled ancient warriors. They had insect-like exoskeletal armor, horned heads, additional hind and forelimbs, and integrated bladed weapons. What Dr. Gazelli and his companions thought would be paradise turned out to be a kind of hell as they were led into the temple, where temporal and spatial distortions broke their mind, and the multiple highly aggressive instances of SCP-3989-3, Dash 2A and Dash 2B broke their bodies. The whole thing had been a horrifying trap. In that moment, back at Area 126, another fleshy, horrifying tree sprouted out of the ground in the middle of the complex. Monsters that had once been Dr. Gazelli and his followers emerged from its amniotic sacs and all hell broke loose throughout the complex. Soon enough, the base was crawling with monsters from the Bone Orchard and staff who'd become brainwashed Sarkic cultists working in service of Oruk. Humans were gathered up to be sacrificed to the ever-growing number of anomalous trees. Things came to a head when the anomaly in Area 126 was visited by an outside agent from the Foundation working on behalf of the Hazardous Materials Containment Liaison. Biological containment specialist Dr. Marshall Grant and his team arrived at the site and were horrified to see the sarkic nightmare that had unfolded. They quickly engaged in a firefight with the anomalous creatures and sarkic devotees who'd gained control over Area 126. A number of Dr. Grant's team were lost in the process, but thankfully, they were able to eventually regain control of the base and the anomalous area. After this incident, SCP-3989 was upgraded to Keter class and given a huge upgrade in security, including four meter high concrete walls and a platoon sized regiment of mobile task force members with heavy weaponry. The force that took over the minds of those exposed was designated SCP-3989-5, a force so powerful that those infected are given the choice to self-terminate or be contained forever. This may seem like a somewhat happy ending to a grim tale, but one detail keeps Dr. Grant and everyone at the Foundation who is forced to deal with 3989 awake at night. According to all recent studies into the Bone Orchard, it isn't contained at all. In fact, the active zone is getting bigger. The year is 1941, and the world is gripped by the most violent and widespread war in history. Millions march to war as bloody battles are fought across the globe. Horrendous atrocities are carried out on groups of people, and parts of London are bombed to rubble on a weekly basis. Considering it's only been 20 years since the last World War, it must seem to the early residents of the early 20th century that the world is coming apart at the seams. And amongst the chaos, it'd be easy not to notice a secluded manor house in the English countryside disappearing without a trace for 11 days before suddenly returning to our reality. 
But thankfully, one organization makes it its sole duty to notice the unnoticeable and understand the impossible, the SCP Foundation. And within that anomalous manor house, Foundation agents and researchers were about to find horrors beyond even their darkest imaginations. This is the grim tale of SCP-1461, better known as the House of the Worm. When the manor house reappeared after its 11-day absence, the Foundation zeroed in, sending agents inside to investigate. It was a two-level dwelling complete with 12 bedrooms, four baths, three studies, a main foyer-slash-ballroom, a library, a kitchen, and a pantry basement. The Foundation observed that a number of these rooms had been fitted with rows of bunk beds, similar to a boarding house or barracks. Only later would they understand why. They found that the upper portion of the home exhibited no abnormal qualities whatsoever. But as the agents investigated further, they found an entrance to the truly anomalous portion of the manor, the extensive sublevel system. No previous records of the building kept by the local council indicated that there would be anything below the manor's basement, so either the mysterious previous occupants, who were nowhere to be found, had built this sublevel, or it just appeared here on its own. Regardless of which was the case, agents and researchers knew that whatever had happened down here had everything to do with the manor's mysterious disappearance. They descended into the depths of what seemed like a man-made cave system, constructed primarily from a mix of concrete, iron, and brass. It was a behemoth of 20th century technology, intricate snaking systems of pipes, gears, and pumping pistons. It was like someone had built an entire factory down here. But for what? The agents began to spread out through the labyrinthian bowels of the manor, hoping to find some answers. But all they seemed to discover was more questions. This place hadn't been built with any form of comprehensible logic. It was full of dead ends. Stairways that ascended and descended to nowhere. Doors that would open to reveal just walls behind them or not open at all. It was like a maze built by a maniac. It didn't help that it looked like the place was recently hit by an earthquake, with some passages caved in and mangled machinery strewn about. It seemed that no human workers had interfered with the impossibly complex and bizarre machinery in quite some time. A number of the materials used to construct said machinery, as well as the grey sandstone filling in the collapsed passageways, remain unidentified to this day. Already, the sublevel was proving to be a complex puzzle box with only an estimated 75% of its layout ultimately being mapped by Foundation researchers. However, they would soon realize that this place wasn't just confusing, it was deadly. The only method of self-maintenance detected by the exploring agents were pipes that would fire a thick black lubricant onto the surrounding machinery. One of the Foundation agents had the misfortune of getting covered in it while exploring a darkened passageway and 80% of his body was melted as a result. It appeared that the viscous black goo was incredibly corrosive to all organic matter. A number of the machines also emitted dangerously high quantities of gamma and X-ray radiation, making it difficult to explore many of the caverns without heavy hazmat protection. And worst of all, were the extremely hostile creatures living in the caves who would regularly attack Foundation personnel. These abominations came to be known as SCP-1461-1, vicious steampunk Frankenstein monsters, once human, but with large parts of their bodies replaced by crude mechanical implants, including metal teeth and claws. 1461-1s have displayed a taste for human flesh, and they have dragged multiple Foundation agents down into their lair to be converted into monsters like them. It's believed that SCP-1461 is capable of controlling these bees through the strategic use of sound from its brass-speaking pipes, leading them into areas where Foundation personnel are present to instigate conflict. Many of these pitiful creatures have had their throats replaced by phonographs, endlessly repeating the same nonsense phrases over and over again. I am what you have made me. I am choice, and I am tyranny. Forgive me. I am then and I am now, what gods they will be then. I am evil and I am flesh, I am the trap. I am beauty and I am chaos, children are selfish. I am the worm, I have broken God. Still in spite of the mazes, monsters and deadly chemicals, the agents persisted and managed to discover several important locations. The gel production chamber on sublevel 3 creates glass jars from the unidentified sandstone 
and fills them with a slime that looks to contain living eyes and teeth. The factory deliveries room is filled with a huge number of crates and boxes, which seem to shift and change in number between Foundation patrols. The speaking tube room on sublevel 11 contains a grand pulpit that acts as the connecting point for the complex array of speaking tubes running through the entire cave system. The body parts of a deceased female also appear to be wired into the machinery, like spare parts. And on sublevel 12, they found the so-called catalyst room. Here, they discovered a huge, complicated, clockwork and steam-powered machine that appeared to be broken and missing some parts. Most horrifying of all, though, is the raised platform in the center of the catalyst room, on top of which is a metal hospital bed. A desiccated male corpse rests upon the bed, its chest punctured by large syringes connected by tubes to some kind of pumping machine. The parts connecting this pumping machine to the overall apparatus of the room were missing, though, leaving its purpose a mystery. The Foundation assumed that fluids used to be drawn out of this corpse to somehow power the machine. You may be starting to worry that there doesn't seem to be any answers here, that this house is one big mystery. But lucky for you, you're wrong. An old journal was also discovered in the Catalyst Room, and if what was written inside is to be believed, that we may finally have some truth about who created the House of the Worm, why it was created, and what horrible events triggered its mysterious disappearance and reappearance. His true name has been redacted by the Foundation, and special efforts have been made to maintain secrecy around the house, seeing as it's an anomaly of great interest to a cult known as the Church of the Broken God. So we'll just call the one who made this place the Inventor. Before any of this, the inventor was one of the many Englishmen traumatized and almost killed in the horrific trench battles of World War I. After a near-death experience, the inventor, like many geniuses and madmen, was plagued by surreal and nightmarish visions. He saw a huge creature that he referred to as the Worm, a gigantic metal monstrosity with dragon-like jaws full of gnashing gears that rampaged through Europe, destroying and devouring everything in its path. These apocalyptic visions also presented him with a solution, vague blueprints for a machine that might be the salvation of him and others willing to take his new gospel to heart, an escape from a world that the inventor knew in his heart was about to end. He hired work-starved laborers from across the country to help him make his visions a reality, and began a massive secret construction project beneath his isolated country manor house. For the inventor, it was all a labor of love. He wanted to protect his wife, son, and daughter from the terrible jaws of the worm. But as the project stretched on, his wife began to suspect that he'd lost his mind. Many of his workers, however, felt just the opposite. They became infatuated by the inventor's sermons on the nature of the worm and the coming apocalypse they hoped to escape. Soon enough, they had become a bona fide cult, constructing the elaborate sublevels underneath the house in preparation for the fast approaching day of reckoning. Then came World War II. The inventor saw Hitler, hungry for war, as one of the avatars of the worm. Finally, knowing that the time was right, he activated the machine and successfully trapped the worm in the bowels of his mechanized home. However, as the Blitz raged and London's bombing began, the inventor felt as though he hadn't stopped anything. He realized once and for all that he was never meant to stop the apocalypse, only escape it. And by throwing the final switch and setting the machine he and his followers had built into overdrive, he did just that. This was the moment that the House of the Worm disappeared, transporting the inventor, his family, and his devoted staff to a different world. An empty gray world, devoid of war but also lacking all the comforts of regular life, including food. Things went downhill from there, as their supplies quickly began to run out and the cult descended into cannibalism in order to survive. Things weren't going much better in the inventor's personal life. His wife, fearing what would happen to the family, took her own life and the life of his daughter. Though by this point, the inventor's mind was so fractured that it's possible he may have killed them himself. Either way, it was only the inventor and his son left, and more trouble was brewing. Eudora, one of the staff trapped in the building with the inventor and his cult, started a mutiny. She claimed the worm spoke to her from below, and that their only path to salvation was pleasing the worm. How would they please it? A sacrifice, of course. 
They would give it the son of the man who had trapped it. The mutineers took the inventor's only remaining child and descended into the lowest sub-levels. The inventor followed, hoping to track them down, save his son, and salvage something from this nightmare. As he ventured deeper, battling the members of Eudora's new cult, he found that they were changing themselves, becoming the half-human cyborg creatures that the Foundation would later discover. The inventor would find Eudora herself in the speaking tube room. Her body, still living, was wired into the machinery, and she had sacrificed his son to the worm. In a rage, the inventor murdered Eudora, or whatever was left of her, then heard a familiar voice speaking out of a nearby speaking tube. It said, I am what you have made me. I am then, and I am now. I am choice, and I am tyranny. I am evil, and I am flesh. I am beauty, and I am chaos. I am the worm. The voice was his own. In that terrible moment, the inventor realized that the worm wasn't a giant, all-devouring monster. It was him. In trying to protect his loved one from a perceived apocalypse, he'd brought them all to their horrible demise. He'd trap them with the monster he'd hoped for them all to escape from, because no matter what you build, you can't escape from who you are. Grief-stricken and broken, the inventor descended into the catalyst room. There was his son, stuck with the syringes, drained of all life to fuel the mighty machine his father had created. In his last moments, the inventor decided to do the only noble thing. He threw himself into the machine, destroying both it and himself in the process. The house was transported back to our own reality, but the worm, in a sense, was no more. But who knows if the worm is really dead? Its thoughts and poisonous intent still lingers in the caverns and rattles through the speaking pipes. Whatever really happened, the Foundation is still picking up the pieces today, and who knows what lurks in the parts still hidden from our knowledge. In a remote part of Russia, a mysterious disease outbreak was tearing through a tiny farming village with terrifying side effects. There was no cure, no clue to where it came from, and worst of all, the disease's terrifying impact didn't end with death. No, it was after those carrying the disease died that the real horrors started. After an agonizing fever that leaves the victims writhing in pain, they quickly succumb to the disease, only to rise from their graves to wreak havoc on the living. The virus continues to spread until the corpses outnumber those trying to hide from them, as the world spirals into almost certain ruin. It sounds like the plot of a zombie movie, but for the SCP Foundation, this is anything but fiction. And the terror that unfolded in that little Siberian town is the first recorded encounter with SCP-610, also known as the Flesh That Hates. First, livestock began to vanish from farms. Theft or wild animals were suspected, but no suspects could be found, and no mutilated remains turned up. The animals weren't being stolen, and they weren't being eaten, so... What happened to them? With no more animals left to lose, the farmers themselves then began to disappear. But the authorities refused to take the missing persons' cases seriously. The missing farmers' families would contact the police, make a report, and then the whole thing was forgotten. It was written off just as another unsolved disappearance, which wasn't uncommon in the wild and unforgiving region. Then, the police themselves began to disappear. The families of the missing farmers would sometimes report strange sounds from the surrounding woods, describing moans and inhuman screeches of pain. One young boy reported seeing a cow with what he described as tentacles lurking around the edge of the trees. Regional police were dispatched to the location and ordered to investigate and report back on their findings within 24 hours, but the units sent to the area didn't report back and were never heard from again. Upon learning of the reports, the Russian government grew increasingly concerned, fearing domestic insurgency or foreign espionage of some kind could be at play. They sent a small team of special agents to the area, and one by one, those agents disappeared, just like the others before them. It seemed no one who went into the village after the disappearances started ever came out again. They had all simply vanished. Desperate for answers, the Russian government contacted the only people in the world who could help. The SCP Foundation. What the Foundation found over the course of their investigation would shock and unnerve them. 
going beyond anything they had previously discovered. Before the investigation officially began, the affected area was sealed off by the Russian government. Not knowing if it would be safe to send researchers into the containment perimeter, the Foundation set up a small camera-mounted unit, nicknamed Herbie, to capture footage of whatever remained of the village. The images captured by Herbie revealed what exactly had become of the people in this doomed village, and the true nightmarish nature of SCP-610. SCP-610 is a Keter-class entity, meaning it's an anomaly that's exceedingly difficult to contain consistently or reliably, with containment procedures often being extensive and complex. 610 is a highly contagious skin disease that initially manifests like an ordinary allergic reaction, with symptoms including increased sensitivity, itching, and a rash. But within just three hours of those initial symptoms appearing, the rash starts to turn into masses of scar tissue on the chest and arms. These masses spread over the legs and back of the victim and completely consume them in thick, rubbery flesh within five hours. Once they're covered, the victim will cease all vital functions. Unfortunately for them, and doubly so for those around them, they do not stay dead. About three minutes after expiring, the victim's vitals will restart at a heightened rate, and the masses of flesh encasing their body will begin to move and multiply, mutating them into a form beyond anything resembling the human they once were. The specific type of mutation varies from case to case, but has included the head becoming massive and bulbous, the growth of extra limbs, and, in especially gruesome cases, the victim's body splitting apart to allow extra tendrils of flesh to sprout from the open wound. Occasionally, an infected person will stop moving and become rooted to the ground in a set location. Once it is settled, their flesh will spread itself across the ground encasing all nearby objects in flaps of scar tissue. The infected that maintain their mobility are highly aggressive, even violent, and will attempt to infect any living thing that comes into their line of sight. The disease does not only infect humans, and can take over any living organism within a matter of hours. Due to the highly contagious and dangerous nature of the disease, safe observation of infected specimens and areas is only possible with drones and mounted cameras. This brings us back to Herbie the first such mounted camera to record footage of the infected area. Herbie was deployed to an infection site, also known as Site A, without any damage. It remained at the outside perimeter of the village for two hours, observing several infected humans and fire damage to many of the homes, before following an infected into an intact house. Herbie's camera feed captured the infected person entering the house and sitting down at the table inside. There were several other infected humans in the house, and one unidentified infected creature that remained immobile under the table. After viciously assaulting one of the other infected humans, the infected returned to the table and began to lay out plates on top of it. Pieces of its flesh began to wriggle and tear away from its body, before settling onto each plate. Once the plates were filled, the infected sitting at the table began to grab at the flesh and crush it into their mouths, in a perverse imitation of a normal mealtime gathering. After capturing this stomach-churning display, Herbie left the house and continued to explore the village. It recorded footage of a large stack of bodies that seemed to be made up of both Russian military and civilians, with an infected sitting on top. As Herbie maneuvered towards the remains of the town hall, an infected grabbed the rover off the ground. Herbie's camera was able to capture the face of the infected that grabbed the rover. The face was that of a young girl, around 10 years old, strangely intact atop a large, distorted body. The final moments of Herbie's camera feed captured the infected girl's face bursting open, revealing tendrils of flesh that pulled Herbie into the gaping maw. Then, the feed cut to black. Herbie was regarded as lost, but the video feed briefly resumed five hours later, showing the camera covered with an unidentified slime. After this, the video feed was cut for good, and Herbie abandoned in sight A. The Foundation has sent several manned expeditions into Site A, where many expedition forces have fallen victim to the infected. Several operatives were also lost in an earthquake that revealed a network of underground tunnels. A manned expedition into these tunnels was attempted, and the video feed that was captured by the researchers on the expedition was deeply disturbing. There were images of an abandoned church filled with infected, and a mass of uninfected or partially infected human captives. The final moments of the video feed from this expedition captured several operatives being murdered by an infected human wielding a farming scythe, indicating that the infected are capable of using simple weaponry in addition to brute force. The use of this weapon, paired with the presence of captives in the underground tunnels, 
paints a terrifying picture of the kind of organization the infected are capable of. No more manned expeditions have been attempted, or if they have, they have been highly classified. Ordinarily, once a new SCP is discovered, it is placed in containment at the Foundation, with special procedures in place so that it can be studied or even neutralized in the rare occasions where it's deemed necessary. When it comes to SCP-610, though, containment might just be impossible. It simply covers too much area and is too dangerous to expose to human researchers. Instead, all infected areas have been isolated with the permission of the Russian government. There is an official perimeter established around these areas, and any civilians that approach them are told to leave under the pretense of ongoing military operations. For once, a top-secret military project is the more innocent answer. Armed guards are placed at the perimeter of every infected area, and any living thing with symptoms of SCP-610 spotted near the perimeter is to be immobilized, killed, and burned from as far away as possible. Any living thing that comes in contact with SCP-610, whether a soldier, a scientist, or a civilian, is immediately terminated and their remains destroyed. If someone comes within three meters of an infected organism, they will be quarantined and remotely examined to determine if they have been infected. While the spread of SCP-610 can be airborne, it has been determined to be far less contagious when spread through air particles as opposed to physical contact. The infection sites remain active to this day, like modern-day leper colonies, though they are isolated from the general population and the military is doing everything in their power to contain the infected. SCP-610 is still very much alive. It is rare for an entity to exist that the Foundation cannot truly contain but can only try to guard against, and that makes this infection all the more terrifying. Who knows how much it has mutated over the years, growing, spreading, hungry for new hosts. There is still so much that the Foundation does not know about the flesh that hates, such as how it works, what it can do, or even where it came from, since the origin of the first infection is still, at this point, entirely unknown. It has shown itself to be capable of learning, planning, and protecting itself, so who is to say that it couldn't figure out a way to escape from its isolated area? It is so highly contagious and spreads so quickly that just one tiny infected rabbit and one inattentive soldier could be enough for SCP-610 to reach the general population. If it did, its violent, destructive nature and hatred for all life would mean that everything, not just the people, but animals, plants, and the world itself, could be at risk. And no one is ready for this kind of infection, a disease that turns the human body against itself, turns our skin into a weapon and a tomb, stripping away identity, humanity, and everything that isn't made of the same hateful flesh. So let's hope that the perimeter holds, and the next time you feel a little itchy, try not to think about what might happen next. It rides against the snow, red, raw, and vicious. Too many mouths, too many limbs, twitching and dripping. Once it looked a lot like you, but now it's something different entirely. If ever it escapes its bounds, it'll rebuild the whole world in its image. It is known and feared by everyone with sufficient clearance at the SCP Foundation. And for good reason. It'll infect anyone and anything, and a death sentence is preferable to infection. It is a disease that thinks, the crawling corruption, the flesh that hates. Or if you fear its true name too much to speak it and find comfort in the categorization and clinical eyes of the SCP Foundation, SCP-610. SCP-610 is a contagious skin disease transmitted by direct contact. Anyone infected with it suffers a horrific mutation, turning them into fleshy, inhuman monstrosities. These infected creatures will attack and infect anyone nearby that isn't also carrying SCP-610. This also happens to be the flesh described and adored by those following the twisted religion of Sarcasism, a violent cult and group of interests that worships flesh, corruption, and disease. And as the Foundation operatives tasked with observing groups of interest know, Sarcasism is a sect that directly opposes the machine-revering Church of the Broken God. And to understand the events of the tale known to the SCP Foundation as Aftermath, the beginning that leads to its brutal and world-changing end, 
one must first understand the endless conflict between these two groups. The Church of the Broken God is a religion that the SCP Foundation has had a number of encounters with over the years. Members of the Church share in the belief that biological, flesh-based life is an inherently wrong and evil abomination. They worship mechanization, the process of making organic bodies something more mechanical in nature. According to the beliefs of the Church, two gods, Yaldabaoth and Mekain, created humanity together. Yaldabaoth was the god of flesh and animal instinct, granting humans bodies. Meanwhile, the god of machine and intellect, Mekain, blessed man with the power of free thought. As humankind developed machines, Yaldabaoth became enraged that they were ignorant of the instincts she had given them and endeavored to destroy the creations of man. As the church's legend goes, Mekain acted as humanity's savior and tried desperately to stop Yaldabaoth. The god of machines shattered himself, transforming his body into a number of pieces to form a cage for his fellow god. Fragments of Mekain rained down on planet Earth. Now the Church of the Broken God believes it is their duty to recover these missing parts. There could potentially be hundreds of pieces needed to rebuild Mekain, and a number of these happen to be cataloged SCPs that the Foundation is either aware of or has in containment. Our story begins not with the long-awaited return of Mekain the Broken God, instead it begins with a man, a Foundation foot soldier named Roderick Freeman. This is the story of Aftermath. In 2003, at the age of 17, Roderick's ambition was to join the US Navy and become a member of the renowned Navy SEALs. After enlisting and completing three years of rigorous training, he achieved his ambition, only to climb even further to heights he never could have foreseen. In 2017, Roderick, now a SEAL, was recruited by the SCP Foundation after his skills and aptitude caught the attention of their embedded recruiters. He joined one of the Foundation's MTFs, or Mobile Task Forces, elite units that are often sent in to directly deal with anomalous threats. Specifically, Freeman became a member of MTF New 7, also known by the codename Hammer Down, the task force you call in when literally nothing else can do the job. To bring Hammer Down onto the scene for anything less than a potential XK is like swatting a housefly with a nuclear warhead. So Roderick, a gun-ho soldier boy if there ever was one, would fit right in. But what does this mobile task force have to do with all that talk about the Church of the Broken God and the flesh that hates? Well, after an incident that broke out in the Irkutska area in Russia, they were the ones responsible for cleaning up the mess left behind. According to Roderick's account, a robot the size of a small building was spotted in this area during December 2018. This 30-foot-tall robot had apparently come to wipe out a rapidly spreading disease. As you can probably guess, that disease was SCP-610, the flesh that hates. At first, the Global Cult Coalition had fired on the robot, launching a volley of ballistic missiles in an attempt to take it down. This move failed, the robot protecting itself so that not even a piece of shrapnel could hit it. It barely seemed phased by the attack and went about destroying remnants of SCP-610 as it found them. Any infected with the flesh were obliterated, and when its job was done, the robot simply left. Perhaps this wasn't quite the grandiose return for Mekane that the Church of the Broken God had envisioned for their deity, but it was nevertheless the long-awaited return they got. What had happened was that the SCP Foundation called a lifted veil scenario. The truth was now out. The world would soon be aware of the existence of anomalies. Afterwards, Freeman and the rest of Hammerdown recovered a series of tablets that had been left behind by Mekane. Each of them bore a simple, repeated phrase in a variety of language. Just the words, I will return. A short time later, riots began to spark across the world. It was a disaster too big for even the Foundation to cover up. According to Roderick, multiple anomalous groups such as the Serpent's Hand and the Chaos Insurgency had gone public. In Mexico, the Insurgency became involved in illegal businesses that gave the cartels an anomalous run for their ill-gotten money, while members of the Serpent's Hand used the air of tension to incite riots. In short, everything was a mess and this eventually escalated to a full-scale civil war in Mexico in 2021. 
During the build-up to this, around 2019, there was unrest around the world, and mobile task forces like Hammerdown were being deployed to train alongside various public safety organizations, all in the hopes of getting the world prepared for the storm gathering all around them. The insurgency and the hand had revealed the truth about anomalies to the world, and so the Foundation's MTFs were aiding law enforcement, special forces, and the like readying them to defend against the anomalous. In 2022, the Foundation finally decided to intervene in the situation down in Mexico, where the chaos insurgency and the Serpent's Hand had been causing disruption. Roderick Freeman was one of those sent to Juarez, coming face to face with former cartel members turned lackeys for the insurgency. The chaos insurgency had been fighting with the Foundation for decades and knew all their tactics. Combine that with the ferocity and brutality of a lifelong cartel member, and even the toughest soldier is in for a fight. As it turns out, the fight wasn't even the worst part for our dedicated little soldier. While attempting to transport a person of interest across the Texas-Mexico border, Roderick and his squad were ambushed by a sniper. During the attack, Freeman received a wound to his spine that left him paralyzed from the hip down. However, even though the Foundation didn't like to admit it, the Church of the Broken God was actually highly skilled in surgery. After all, they worshipped mechanization and would often augment themselves using technology. Or, to use Roderick's own words, if you wanted an iPhone in your skull in 2009, they could have pulled it off. If you wanted to be able to turn the lights on and off in your home by blinking, they had an upgrade for that. If you lost the use of your legs because of a sniper on a rooftop in Juarez, they had you covered. Thanks to members of the church, there had been a new technological revolution since the lifting of the veil. By 2024, devices that felt like they were 20 years more advanced than technology should have been were now commonly available. So that's how Roderick Freeman was able to walk again. However, the SCP Foundation refused to let him return to duty, forcing him into an administrative role. Frustrated, he applied for a job as a containment specialist. Meanwhile, the state of the world was constantly changing, with the SCP Foundation handing over safe anomalies to world governments. New divisions and departments were being formed to deal with the containment of SCPs. There was even an anomaly registration program that allowed people to call 911 to report dangerous or life-threatening anomalies. Anyone exhibiting anomalous abilities could now find doctors or therapists rather than being carted off to a containment cell. In short, the Foundation's days were numbered. However, this was not as idyllic as it sounds. According to Roderick, this should have been a chance for the civil rights of anomalous people to be respected, something that the Serpent's Hand had been campaigning for since their modern inception. Instead, it meant that anyone with anomalous traits perceived to be dangerous was arrested as threats to national security. Things were nowhere near as restrictive as under the Foundation. The safer anomalies could even have visits from family. But there was one boy, Thomas, whom Roderick had to look after, remarking that he wasn't old enough to be kept in a containment setting. Little did Roderick know, the tests that were being run on Thomas were keeping tabs on him. Somehow, the boy was able to use anomalous abilities to watch where Roderick was at all times. The SCP Foundation was finally disbanded in 2027, with the containment of anomalies becoming the responsibility of the Global Coalition Council. This organization had long been the official sanctioned counterpart to the more off-the-books Foundation, despite their more violent methods. But now the GOC was making their work known to the public. But with the Foundation gone, Roderick was out of work, picking up odd jobs over the next six years. There was widespread criticism of the SCP Foundation and its dubious methods, the dark things they'd done to keep anomalies contained. Civilians killed, entire populations given memory-wiping drugs to forget about SCPs, the horrific treatment of D-Class personnel. A document containing details about these practices and more was leaked, causing an outcry. The SCP Foundation's brutal methods were declared to be crimes against humanity. Alongside this, paranoia about anomalies was spreading. Governments were encouraging their citizens to report paranormal happenings, and people with anomalous traits were being registered and arrested. In Roderick's account, he says, When people don't understand something, one of two things will happen. They will try to understand it so they can use it for their own ends, or, and this is far more likely, they will grow afraid of it and try to destroy it. 
So, it was when humanity rediscovered anomalies, former Foundation employees were declared public enemy number one, with anomalous persons a close second. When former members of the Foundation began to find themselves on trial by the United Nations, the public began executing any ex-Foundation personnel they could find. At first, local police or even the National Guard would intervene, but some eventually started actively helping the vigilante mobs. There was nowhere for Roderick to hide. The FBI even used the Unusual Incidents Unit to track down the Foundation's remaining members. Some had even been hired by the UIU to bring in their former co-workers. And for anyone who knows how utterly useless the Unusual Incidents Unit are, to be brought in for execution by them is a truly humiliating death. Unsure who to trust, Roderick turned to Agent Leonard Wells, a man whose life he had once saved. Meeting at a diner in Wisconsin, Leonard agreed to smuggle Roderick to Russia for $5,000, getting him safely out of the FBI's jurisdiction. Freeman agreed, and was then led to an SUV with three other men that he didn't recognize. According to Leonard, they were just there to help smuggle Roderick. The five of them drove to an isolated stretch of road, only to stop. Something was terribly wrong. Leonard told Roderick to exit the car, claiming that they would need to switch vehicles. As the SUV drove off, Leonard handed Roderick a flashlight and told him to signal a nearby grove of trees. And then, according to a report, Roderick X. Freeman was wanted by the U.S. government for the actions he was involved in during his time at the SCP Foundation. He was believed to have been responsible for human rights violations and was picked up by agents of the FBI's Unusual Incidents Unit. The report claimed that Roderick engaged the UIU agents with a small firearm, although he had reached out to Agent Leonard Wells for help. Whether he was executed or tried to run away, Roderick Freeman was shot and killed. But that was far from the worst part about his death. Dying is bad enough, but witnessing death, especially at a young age, is something that can have a long-lasting effect. But who was there to see what happened? Or rather, who could see without being there? Thomas, the young anomalous boy Roderick had been assigned to, had seen the whole thing. The world had changed undeniably. It has been said that the Foundation dies in the dark so that we can live in the light. But when the same light was turned on the Foundation itself, it seemed that they couldn't survive under its scrutiny either. Whether the world is better or worse without them is something only you can decide. There are some things human beings aren't meant to know, and it's the sworn duty of the SCP Foundation to discover and contain such information. But sometimes knowledge is discovered that shakes even the Foundation itself to its very core. One such discovery occurred on April 28, 2016. That night, SCP-2935 made itself known to the Foundation personnel. To this day, the exact nature of SCP-2935 is a mystery that even the Foundation's brightest minds can't completely understand. Everything we know know about SCP-2935 today comes from three doomed missions to the anomalous zone's interior. This is the story of those infamous expeditions. The nightmare began around 5 a.m. when SCP Foundation Site 81 in Bloomingdale, Indiana intercepted a distorted radio signal. Communications personnel at the site traced this strange signal back to the unincorporated area of Joppa, Indiana, near U.S. Interstate 70. As is Foundation policy, a team of field agents were dispatched to the location in order to determine what they were dealing with. However, rather than finding anything that could logically produce such a signal, they instead discovered a long-abandoned cemetery. The most recent death on any of the tombstones was recorded as being over a hundred years ago, all the way back in 1908. On further investigation, the Foundation discovered an unmapped limestone cave opening beneath the cemetery, and when they sent a drone into the depths of the cave, it appeared to quickly exit out the other side of the cave. But something wasn't right. The area that the drone was observing appeared consistent with the landscape from which it entered, but now it looked somehow grayer. It lacked the color of life of the place it just come from. The grass was dead, there were no trees, no shrubs, no animals or birds in the sky. They weren't looking at our world, they were looking at a strange reflection of our world on the other side of the cave. In fact, it wasn't a cave at all, it was a passageway between two dimensions. It was SCP-2935. Just then, they were able to unscramble the distorted transmission they'd been receiving. It went as follows. This is an automated emergency broadcast from the SCP Foundation and your national government. One or more of our sites is experiencing a communication breakdown 
likely due to a containment breach of unknown magnitude. All citizens are ordered to stay in their homes as containment teams work to secure the breach. This message will broadcast from April 20, 2016 until at that point, the message would cut and repeat, as it had for eight straight days. The message source? Site 81, but not this Site 81. The SCP Foundation was receiving an emergency distress signal from themselves in another dimension, a bizarre event that even the Foundation had never experienced before. Field agents were terrified by the implications of what they just heard and contacted Site 81 Command to request additional units. The Foundation wished to fully understand this anomaly as quickly as possible due to the potential threat it could pose toward the Foundation, so they dispatched Mobile Task Force Epsilon 13, codenamed Manifest Destiny, to perform the first of three manned missions into the heart of the anomalous zone. The first exploratory mission into SCP-2935 was codenamed Gauntlet and consisted of a four-man team fitted with full hazmat suits and direct video and audio links to Mission Command. The team was led by a field operative known only as Agent Juno. His subordinates were Agents Kale, Devon, and Underwood. Their directive was to gather samples and survey the area positioned directly around the insertion point, meaning the other cave mouth of SCP-2935. The mission only lasted about an hour, but what they saw in there would stay with these men for the rest of their lives. After a 15-minute trek through the cave, Manifest Destiny arrived in the mirror dimension, where they were struck by the eerie silence of a place that seemed identical and yet so different from their home dimension. The first observation they made was the total absence of all living vegetation. Trees, grass, weeds, everything, it was all dead. On orders from their superiors back in the original dimension, that we'll refer to from here on as Dimension Prime, Manifest Destiny headed deeper into the mirror dimension of SCP-2935. They traveled two kilometers without detecting a single sign of plant or animal life, not even insects. Eventually, they came upon a farmhouse with two cars parked outside. With authorization from command, Manifest Destiny breached the house and headed inside. Agent Kale confirmed that there was still power flowing to the building as the lighting appeared to work just fine, but they came upon a horrifying discovery in the house's dining room. Three adult corpses, two female, one male, were seated at the table. A fourth corpse, that of a male child, was sprawled out on the ground nearby. As if the death of what looked to be an entire family wasn't awful enough, the Manifest Destiny team noticed a number of other alarming details. There were no signs of decomposition on the bodies, nor did there appear to be any obvious cause of death. The family's last meal was still on the table, chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. While the food looked cold and stale, there was no evidence of rot or spoiling. The team found an open newspaper dated April 19, 2016, illustrating that the family may have died a full eight days before the discovery. In Dimension Prime, decay would already be very well underway by that point, yet here there wasn't even a smell. Instead, everything was just covered in a thin layer of dust. Command requested that Manifest Destiny collect samples of the food as well as hair, skin, and fluids from the corpses for further study. Small electronics like smartphones were also taken from the bodies. Agent Devon turned on the television in the living room and found that while most stations were now running test signals, the shopping channel was still live. Well, the feed was live at least. Both hosts sat in front of the cameras dead, but perfectly preserved. The date on the screen read April 28, 2016 suggesting that the times of Dimension Prime and Mirror Dimension were exactly the same. In fact, everything seemed the same, the only difference between the two dimensions being that some kind of mysterious apocalyptic event had occurred in the last eight days in SCP-2935's Mirror Dimension, but exactly what had happened or how remained a mystery. When Manifest Destiny exited the farmhouse, they once again remarked on the lack of all signs of life around them. At this point, the team returned to the insertion point of SCP-2935, but were instructed to remain in the mirror dimension while additional units joined them inside. Manifest Destiny swelled to 16 members, with the notable addition of Agent Roy as the new commanding field officer. The team split into two groups of eight, and Agent Roy and his men infiltrated the mirror dimension Site 81, while Agent Juno's detachment attempted to access the base's off-site deep storage servers. This second expedition was codenamed Overland and led the Foundation's field agents even deeper into the terrifying mystery of SCP-2935. Accessing the site was easy for Roy's detachment. It seemed there were relatively few cars on the road at the time of the mysterious extinction event. In the distance, fire still smoldered in the wreckage of planes that looked to have just dropped out of the sky. Agent Roy and his team, like all SCP Foundation personnel, were fitted with vitals trackers, and they assumed that the distress signal that started this whole thing could have been triggered by the deaths of every member of the Foundation at once in the Mirror Universe. 
Once inside Site 81, they realized that the assumption was probably right. Going door to door in the administrative wing, they found the perfectly preserved corpses of everyone they knew to be stationed there in Dimension Prime, people who were without a doubt still alive in their universe. Samples from the corpses that the Foundation would later study even confirmed the reason that the bodies were perfectly preserved. The corpses had experienced complete and sudden death on a cellular level, and even the bacteria that would typically take part in the decomposition process had died with it. In SCP-2935, death was total and absolute, across all types of life forms. As Agent Roy's team ventured further into the bowels of Site-81, they made another unsettling discovery. Their own corpses, in roughly the same spots they'd been inside Dimension Prime's Site-81 eight days prior. Some of the Foundation's top scientists, including the esteemed Dr. Bright, were also found dead inside the facility. In an attempt to see just how far this unexplained phenomenon stretched, Agent Roy's team decided to inspect the containment cells, where they found that all the Mirror Universe's SCPs, including SCP-2996, were dead. In his desperation to find some kind of exception to the extinction event, Agent Roy revealed a terrifying secret to the rest of his team. SCP-682, the immortal misanthropic lizard, and one of the deadliest creatures known to the SCP Foundation, was contained at this very facility right below them. Could it have something to do with what was going on here? They descended into the containment facility to discover an even more unsettling truth. SCP-682, the unkillable anomaly, floated dead in its tank. Death truly made no exceptions within SCP-2935. Agent Roy's team left the site and rendezvoused with Agent Juno's team to send their research back to Dimension Prime using automated drones. Both teams remained in the Mirror Dimension for another manned operation codenamed 19. They had no idea it would be their final mission. As they descended deeper into the facility, passing more dead SCPs, they discovered one final clue. Based on the activity of the Foundation servers, the event occurred at roughly 3 a.m. While underground in SCP-2935 Site-81, the team accidentally activated the base's on-site nuclear weapon, a failsafe meant to be detonated in the case of an emergency containment breach. Due to the base's failsafe protocols, every member of the Manifest Destiny team was locked and sealed inside Site-81. They, along with everything else, were incinerated in the nuclear blast. Once again, the mirror universe inside of SCP-2935 was lifeless. But that isn't where it ends. When the automated drones returned out of the SCP-2935 cave to the field operations in Dimension Prime, they were in for their own horrifying discovery. None of the footage or information gathered from SCP-2935 illuminated how or why the extinction event occurred. Everyone and everything simply dropped dead at the exact same moment. Nobody was aware, nobody was prepared. Death came suddenly and silently, and none were spared. All the Foundation on Dimension Prime were left with was a message from one of the agents from Manifest Destiny, Agent Keller. His final message was, I don't have any answers. I don't think there are any. I'll do this one thing and hope that fixes it. Seal it shut. You've got to lock it in here with us. I'm sorry. The Foundation were at first confused by this until they discovered a final encrypted audio log buried in the files recovered from the Mirror Universe's Site-81. It was a message from Keller himself, but not the Keller from Universe Prime. In this message, Keller described the Foundation in the Mirror Universe, receiving the exact same distorted transmission that they did a few days earlier from a cave in Joppa. When he and the others were dispatched inside, they discovered the same lifeless post-extinction event world that was now so familiar familiar to the Foundation Command. But there was a key difference. This wasn't the mirror dimension they'd just been studying, but a third, entirely different dimension. In his haunting final words, Mirror Dimension Keller admits that whatever caused the event in that third dimension, an entity in that Mirror Dimension Keller believed this was the specter of death itself and had followed him back into his world, and history had repeated itself. SCP-2935 was the passageway through which absolute death could pass from dimension to dimension, and our dimension was the next in line. The deaths of Manifest Destiny may have saved our entire universe, as anyone passing back through the cave had the potential to bring death itself back with them. The Foundation decided in the end to follow Keller's advice. They sealed the entrance to SCP-2935 with concrete and now kept it under constant watch, since what waits behind the barrier is an entity even they have no power to stop if it ever got through. After all, it had killed them all before, or at least another version of them. What's one more dimension on the pile? Why it may now just seem like a simple slab of concrete under an abandoned cemetery, this is why SCP-2935 might be the most dangerous SCP of all.
Shopping malls are one of the most common locations in the United States and are usually quite predictable and boring. So then why is the one mall near Havensbrook, Indiana one of the most closely guarded SCP Foundation sites? The Southwood Park Mall has been shuttered, with the mall encircled by fencing and all entrances closed off. Foundation agents under the supervision of Commander Lana Gray have standing orders that if anything emerges from the mall, it is to be contained by any means necessary, or eliminated with necessary force. Just what is lurking inside? This is SCP-4971, a terrifying uncontained entity that is capable of initializing a VK-class Salted Earth End of Human Habitability scenario. While SCP-4971 appears to be a standard closed American shopping mall from the outside, what's inside is completely different. Within the mall, is a time-space anomaly, and anyone who steps inside will find themselves in a massive outdoor climate under a sun that looks to be perpetually setting. While the climate and flora in the area appear to be similar to the Pacific Northwest or Yukon Territory, testing of samples has been inconclusive. What is clear to those who have explored this biosphere within the mall is that it is much larger than the confines of the mall and the limits of its territory are unknown. But those who wander in are not alone, and that's where the threat lies. The Southwood Park Mall had operated since 1985, but by 2006 the last doors closed and the mall was left vacant and abandoned. The sign of urban blight soon attracted trespassers and criminals. Soon rumors began swirling about the strange rituals being performed by local teens. While many people alleged supernatural doings, no proof was found. That is, until 2007. It started as a standard break-in, and police were notified. But as they explored, they started hearing disturbing sounds. Screams and sounds that didn't sound like they came from this world. The trespassers were nowhere to be found, despite reports that a huge group was there. The search eventually revealed the portal to SCP-4971, which appears at different places in the mall and doesn't seem to be consistent. The Foundation quickly compiled all the information they had on the site and discovered connections to a dangerous group. One of the people reported to break in was Katarina Randolph, a local missing teenager with ties to Anna Christian, who was a known occultist in possession of artifacts used in summoning rituals. Both were members of the Daughters of Eden, a cult that believed that mankind had disrupted the natural order and magic must be used to restore nature to its proper place. The Foundation believed Christian might have been in possession of the Last Appeal of Bifi, a text supposedly based on the last words of a witch killed during a botched exorcism. Many believe the text had the power to summon nature spirits to drive away colonists. While most copies had been destroyed, this one had made its way from Nazi Germany all the way to Miskatonic University in Massachusetts. And now it was potentially in the hands of dangerous cultists. While Anna Christian was apprehended months earlier in a raid on the Daughters of Eden, the manuscript was nowhere to be found, and neither was Katerina Randolph, until she was seen breaking into the Southwood Park Mall just before the anomalous activity began. While the book contains several minor rituals, the final one claims to summon something called the One Who Knows Silence in the Earth, the entity Bifi reportedly called out for in her last words. A raid on Randolph's former living quarters revealed a rambling message where she referred to herself as a daughter of Gaia and Eden, and vowed to avenge the crimes committed against Earth and nature. Knowing these facts, the Foundation debated on how to contain SCP-4971. While they didn't believe the entity had been summoned, they believed it was in process. With the final ritual yet to be completed, a ritual that required a high level of human sacrifice. A team was deployed consisting of codenamed agents. There was the team leader Eclipse, fire team Roman and Mercury, science team Atlantis and Bangkok, and Nine Eyes on Communications. They entered the closed mall, where there had been little activity and turned on their lights to see around the darkened facility. It seemed normal at first, except for the disrepair and vandalism, but they soon noticed something odd. The mall didn't smell like an abandoned building. There was wind in it, and it smelled deeply unpleasant. As they entered the deserted atrium, they noticed the destruction seemed worse than expected, with a collapsed skywalk that couldn't have been knocked down by the vandals. As the team explored an abandoned clothing store, 
they encountered a humanoid figure that seemed to be covered in thick webbing, like they had been the victim of giant spiders who had planned to eat them later. And just beyond them, three unidentified figures lurked but didn't move, their eyes glowing in the darkness. They left the clothing store and decided to watch if the strange figures would follow them, but they remained where they were. The team advanced into the mall, where they could hear the sound of rushing water getting louder despite no water in sight. And it was clear that the area they were exploring was far longer than the Southwood Park Mall should be. A sign on a store seemed to be written in no language at all. As the team entered another large atrium, the mall suddenly ended, and they found themselves in a different world. They stood atop a massive cliff overlooking a forest that seemed to extend forever. The sun was low in the sky and didn't move no matter how long they waited. The land seemed natural, except for a large symbol several meters away. It looked like a series of rings surrounding triangles and small rings carved into the ground. An area in the middle was burned, as if it had been the site of a fire, and several glass vials on the ground had been shattered. But most disturbing was the thick red liquid filling the trenches surrounding the symbols. A quick analysis of the liquid revealed it to be human blood. Further examination of the site revealed an altar, a machete, and pages from the last appeal of Bifi, specifically the ones to summon the entity described in the end. But while the ritual demanded a high level of human sacrifice, no bodies could be found. The ritual was governed by the weight of the human heart sacrificed, and an analysis revealed that the 61 people who had entered the mall and four officers who went missing would have reached a sufficient number to complete the ritual. The Foundation was preparing to bring in a heavy fire team to eliminate the entity before it became a larger threat, but the team was skeptical. They hadn't seen any hostile presence yet, and had no idea what this entity was even supposed to resemble. They reported their findings back to command, offering to bring back the manuscript and other evidence, but were asked to move to a nearby water source and to hold their position until the heavy fire team arrived. They hiked through the nearby woods, noticing an increase in electromagnetic static that started to mess with their equipment. Mercury soon realized that they were being watched. While the other team members were skeptical, Mercury insisted that five or six entities were tailing them to the east. They started hearing odd chattering, unlike any known animal sound. They couldn't locate the entity on thermal, but it soon came into view. It appeared to be an animal, but an odd flashing light appeared around its head, and it kept appearing and disappearing. As they approached the river, the sun, which had not moved for hours, suddenly started setting, and it became abnormally dark. They tried to make contact with command, but the static had shut down their equipment. All recordings then cut out simultaneously, and contact with the team was lost. While the team was not recovered, the Foundation obtained enough information to put together a report on the entity for the heavy fire team. They had determined that SCP-4971 was the largest spatial anomaly ever encountered, being at least 400,000 meters in volume. It seemed to be self-sustaining and maintained by an entity of enormous power. The symbol that appeared in the ritual was known as the Voxen Eye, and appeared in the last appeal of Bifi as the symbol she carved into her chest. It had been referenced repeatedly in arcane writings, and seemed to have its roots in the pre-Columbian North American occult, and it also appeared to be linked to the One Who Knows Silence in the Earth, the ancient being that took its payment in human hearts. It was time to send in the heavy fire team. The team consisted of team lead Horizon, communications officer Aleppo, and heavy fire agents Vestige, Cato, Carrier, Ashen, and Wild. They followed the original team, who had lost contact but was still transmitting their location. The Foundation wanted to set up a long-range transmitter that would make it easier to communicate and set up a permanent base inside the anomaly. They advanced into the eerily quiet forest, the sun back in its usual position. As they walked, an unknown signal suddenly came over their broadcast. It was a song, broken up by static. The girl from Ipanema. The team was confused, but they would soon have much bigger concerns. There was a rustling in the woods, and a large group of figures emerged, followed by a single, much larger figure. It looked vaguely humanoid, but it was surrounded by a tangle of branches, vines, and leaves. More disturbingly, it didn't have a head. In place where its face would be, there was a strange bright triangle that seemed to be vibrating in and out of place. 
The recorders became more and more distorted as soon as this being appeared. The team tried to make contact with the entity, but it didn't respond. They fired their weapons, and the creature screamed and collapsed against a tree. The strange symbol shattered. While the entity seemed to be dead, their sensors picked up a mob of figures moving their way. They heard a high-pitched scream over their earpieces, and they were surrounded by dozens of similar entities. The beings gathered around their fallen member. The team heard an odd sound of breaking glass mending, and the creature rose from the ground and rejoined its brothers, and started advancing towards the team. The team moved away, but was quickly overwhelmed. Kato fell and was overcome by the creatures. Ashen fell in battle, and Wild lost an arm. As the group fled from the creatures, Aleppo's communicator went off. It was Eclipse from the first team contacting for help. Horizon made contact and listened to instructions that told them to head for high ground. The remaining members of the Heavy Fire team headed for a nearby rise, still chased by the chattering entities. The ground under them shook, and Wild fell behind and was snatched by the entities. In the end, it was only Aleppo, Vestige, and Carrier that survived to meet Eclipse. They compared notes, and Eclipse said that they had been there for a week trying to survive against the hostile beings. But the Heavy Fire team had entered less than a day after them, and had been there less than half a day. Something was wrong with the passage of time, but the team had barely any time to reflect on this in their new safe spot. They heard intense static from the radios, followed by a low, droning sound. Their cameras broadcast a single still frame of something approaching, a multi-legged entity. And then their communications cut out and both teams were lost again. Additional recordings were found from the survivors of the first team led by Eclipse, detailing their experiences within the anomaly. They reported being in there for months, with their rations running out. While the water was drinkable, they reported it may be making them sick. The plants were inedible, burning their mouths, and the sun seemed to move only with their movements. They approached a mountain, seeking what they believed was a way back home. But as they approached, they encountered a mysterious figure that appeared to be a naked woman dancing near a symbol on the ground and a human heart. The team tried to contact her, and realized she was singing the same song they had heard on the radio earlier. It was Katarina Randolph, the missing cultist. When she turned around, they could see a large wound on her chest. As she ignored the team's orders, Nine Eyes fired and Randolph crumpled to the ground. Suddenly, there was a surge of energy, and the team was knocked to the ground. A new entity appeared in front of them, a massive being with a deer-like appearance but missing its head and neck surrounded by glowing orbs and with a massive white crest in place of its head. Suddenly, Randolph's body lifted into the air and the girl began speaking again. She called out to Gaia, claiming the entity could have her, and Randolph was transformed into one of the entities as her head collapsed in on itself. The sky darkened and the team was lifted into the air, their hearts suddenly pulled from their chests. Only Mercury was left standing, running for safety. He was cornered by Katarina, pulled his gun, and the footage cut out one last time. SCP-4971 Nabla had been discovered, and it was one of the most dangerous beings the Foundation had ever encountered. An interview with Anna Christian, now in Foundation custody, revealed that the creature was sustained by rituals, all magical rituals of any kind. Human sacrifice gave it extra power, but it derived strength from everything, including the Foundation's many magical locks to contain entities. Stopping all operations would weaken the creature, but would also endanger the Earth countless times over by the potential release of the other contained entities. It was unkillable. It was near impossible to contain, and it was searching for a way out into the world. And it was only a matter of time before it found it. The good news is that there is a reverse ritual, but the price is high. The last appeal of Bifi contains a reverse incantation that seals the portal to SCP-4971, but it requires a human sacrifice as well, and the cost increases exponentially. The Foundation investigated and discovered that the cost would eventually increase to the lives of every living being on Earth that had not already been converted into the beings inside SCP-4971. The SCP Foundation was faced with an impossible choice. Here was an incredibly powerful being that could end the world, and the only two ways to stop it both posed an unacceptable risk to the world. The Foundation met to discuss their options, and came up with a new esoteric classification for the object. 
Sir Nunons. Objects classified as Sir Nunons can be functionally contained, but the Foundation cannot achieve this due to logistical or ethical reasons. Therefore, SCP-4971 remains within the Southwood Park Mall, guarded by the Foundation, with SCP-4971 Nabla inside and hopefully contained there, at least for now. London is the second largest city in Europe. And underneath this bustling city is one of the oldest and largest networks of train tunnels in the world. But that's not the only huge old structure located beneath the city of London. Below even the deepest underground metro stations of this historic city, there's a whole artificial world of surveillance cyborgs, impossible architecture, and stomach-churning nutritional supplements. So be sure to mind the gap because we're about to take you on a tour of SCP-1678, also known as Unlondon. SCP-1678 is located one kilometer below the city of London, England. From all appearances, it seems to be an exact copy of the city, though aesthetically, it's more in line with how it was around the turn of the 20th century. Gas streetlights stand on every corner, and the modern skyscrapers of the business district are recreated in the style of Victorian architecture. The epicenter of construction appears to be the Houses of Parliament, which is evidenced by the more unfinished and flawed the city becomes further out from the center one goes. Some of the buildings are made of nonsensical materials like copper pipes, and some of the gas lamps are nothing more than a ball of disembodied light floating atop a metal pole. The first big question that the Foundation had upon discovering this location was, of course, why on earth was it created? And they wouldn't have to look far, as an explanation of this bizarre mirror city plays automatically upon entering. My fellow citizen, if you are hearing this tape, then the world as we know it is finished. The sky has broken, the ground heaves with the tramp of terrible feet, and all the horror and madness from the dark corners of the world has broken free to exact its vengeance on the world of man. Evil has raised its bloody flag upon all nations of the world and crowned its unholy victory to the broken sky. Yes, this is the end. But there is a new hope. Welcome to Unlondon, a city of survivors, a city of the free. Together, fellow citizen, we will wait and prepare for the new beginning, the grand new world that is soon to come. Let the world above burn, we will endure. Let the monsters have their world, we will prepare, we will wait. And I tell you, citizen, that there will be a new morning, and you will emerge from un-London and stand blinking in the sun. And on that day, citizen, there shall be a new order as we raise the Union flag over the entire world. I welcome you to un-London, the last city, and the first. From this message, it seems that this mirror city was built to be a refuge for survivors of an apocalyptic scenario. But the SCP Foundation had no knowledge of such a plan. In fact, it's still unknown who created this place, or how they did it. The one fact that was evident to the Foundation was that even though this strange place was intended to be a safe haven, it was far too poorly constructed to actually act as one. Illumination was unreliable, and most of the buildings were damp and infested with mold. It's also unclear to the Foundation where the oxygen and gas supply of Unlondon was coming from. Throughout the day, the loudspeakers around Unlondon play automated messages such as, No one is safe from the influence of mimetic beings. Bryson's home for the poor is here to help. And, Crime will not be tolerated in Unlondon. The tormentors of society will become its defenders. At the end of every hour that passes, the speakers announce the time, followed by, And all is well. When the SCP Foundation first entered on London, it was unknown whether or not any living things inhabited the city. On first investigation, it seemed from its state of disrepair that the city had been long abandoned. But soon, the Foundation met their first inhabitant of the underground city. Mobile task force members were inspecting the area around the Houses of Parliament when they discovered what looked to be a bank. As they approached the doors, they heard the following announcement over the nearby loudspeakers. Citizen, you are entering a restricted area. Have your authorization papers ready. A bobby will arrive to escort you shortly. This signaled the approach of SCP-1678-A, also known as 
the Bobbies. A single instance of SCP-1678-A appeared with the unmistakable sound of a police whistle, and as soon as it arrived, it started attacking the members of the task force. Another announcement came over the speakers. Police! Halt! Criminal! The Bobbies are the main threat to visitors in on London, and they will attack on site with any improvised weapon they can find. True to their name, they are all dressed in uniforms consistent with those of London City police officers from the Victorian era. What sets them apart from their historical counterparts is their construction. These beings are made out of human corpses, crudely dismembered at the joints, and reassembled using metal hinges and bolts with their heads wrapped in bandages. Bobbies are extremely hard to kill, with only high-caliber rounds and explosive weapons being effective at putting them down. Autopsies of dead bobbies have shown that underneath the police uniform, the bobbies all wear prison inmate-style jumpsuits. This adds a chilling context to the announcement about the tormentors of society becoming its defenders. It appears that the bobbies are the reanimated bodies of prisoners. In addition to the bobbies, the Foundation cataloged two additional forms of artificial life present within on London. First are SCP-1678-B, or Eyes in the Sky hybrid biomechanical birds made of flesh with an exoskeleton of copper wiring. Some of these creatures are covered in a deteriorating outer layer of plastic and feathers, suggesting that they were originally meant to resemble pigeons. As their name suggests, eyes in the sky serve as a type of surveillance drone, and while they have no offensive capabilities, they still pose a significant threat to the Foundation. It's still unclear whether they're able to communicate with or summon the bobbies, but the SCP Foundation takes no chances. The last life form present in SCP-1678 is the strangest and the most frightening, SCP-1678-C, known as the Wretch. The Wretch has only ever been encountered outside the zone, which is now under SCP Foundation control, and it's uncertain how many instances of this being exist. The Wretch resembles an old woman, or sometimes old man, dressed in filthy rags. The Wretch sits at street corners holding a begging tray, and will attempt to elicit pity from anyone who happens to walk by. The Wretch will ask for food or money, but if food is supplied, it will start weeping before vanishing into a puff of black smoke. On a few occasions, audio notices playing on the city's loudspeakers have alluded to this being, saying, Do not pity the wretch. Allow them to pay the price of their betrayal for all eternity. The current Foundation protocol with regards to the wretch is to not engage with it at all. In addition to the bobbies, the eyes in the sky, and the wretches, there's another strange component to the world of Unlondon. Throughout the city, in any area designed for human habitation, the Foundation discovered multiple machines that resembled modern gas pumps. These machines are fitted with coin slots and rubber hoses that, when coins are inserted, dispense a porridge-like substance advertised as Dr. Goody's Wonder Food. According to posters around the city, Wonder Food is a meal replacement supplement, supposedly containing all of the required nutrients for survival. Wonder Food also appears to be the only food source available in Unlondon. Despite the claims by various posters around the city that Wonder Food contains all the nutrients you need and completely restores health and vitality, examination of this substance has revealed that it is, much like the rest of Unlondon, unsuitable for sustaining life. Tests have confirmed that Wonder Food is a synthetic starch gel heavily enriched with various minerals, vitamins, fats, and bulking agents, and it contains artificially engineered DNA helix structures. While it does contain all the elements required for short-term survival, consuming the product for longer than six weeks will result in severe malnutrition and eventually scurvy. Further tests have shown that Wonder Food also contains psychoactive properties. The porridge contains a mixture of unknown molecular compounds which, through regular consumption, make subjects calmer, less anxious, and less likely to resist authority. It also seems to have been engineered to cause withdrawal symptoms that set in if a person stops eating it, symptoms which include headaches and depression. Foundation personnel are forbidden to consume Wonder Food, but the substance is highly attractive to instances of SCP-1678-B and 1678-C. Like most things in London, the quality of Wonder Food varies wildly, with some dispensers putting out a product that is so degraded that it can cause sickness, deformities, or even death in the consumer. 
But strangely, the Foundation has also recorded a type of unknown colorful mollusk which feeds on spillage from the Wonder Food dispensers. At present, UnLondon is only partially contained. Mobile task forces Tau-4 and Epsilon-6 have succeeded in establishing a perimeter around the Hyde Park District, where they have managed to stop any incursion from SCP-1678-A. Even though this is the only area that is fully under Foundation control, explorations have been conducted of buildings outside that perimeter. The investigations are vital for the Foundation's main purpose in UnLondon, which is figuring out who built it and exactly what kind of event this underground mirror city was meant to prepare for. The interior of the Natural History Museum yielded particularly strange insights into the purpose of UnLondon. For the most part, the museum is close to how it appears in the above ground, but with one key difference. The task force investigating the museum discovered an exhibit called The Fall of Man, exactly where the Darwin wing should have been. The exhibit, as its name suggests, details the apocalyptic scenario that would have theoretically driven people underground into un-London. But to everyone's surprise, its dioramas and displays didn't depict an asteroid impact, plague, or nuclear Armageddon. To the Foundation Task Force members, the scenes of destruction depicted in the exhibit were far more familiar. They recognized the reptilian form of SCP-682, the ordinary-looking brownstone basement door that serves as a gateway to SCP-2317, and, most chillingly, the imposing many-eyed figure of the Scarlet King. These were only some of the known Keter-class SCPs depicted in the museum exhibit. It was clear that even though the SCP Foundation hadn't built this city, Whoever did knew a lot about the SCP Foundation's activities. It's believed by the Foundation that whoever or whatever created on London still resides in the Houses of Parliament, and the ultimate goal of the task forces is to infiltrate the building. But in order to do that, they will first need to find where the bobbies are made and halt their production. It's believed that Bryson's home for the poor is where they originate from, but it's unclear exactly where the materials to make them come from, nor is it clear just how they're produced. Ultimately, the Foundation's goal is to catalog the entire city, and once they have stopped the production of more bobbies, MTF Tau-4 and Epsilon-6 will storm the Houses of Parliament and contain whatever force has created UnLondon. But London is a very big city, and UnLondon is just as big, so there's no telling what else they might find exploring this bizarre location. If you have ever taken a trip to Sun Top Mountain in the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest, Washington State, then you may have come across an old wooden structure, the Sun Top Fire Lookout. Built in the early 1930s, the building was used by the U.S. Forest Service to keep watch for any fires in the nearby woodland. At one point, Sun Top Fire Lookout would have been manned 365 days a year, complete with a bed for staff who were stationed there on rotation. The single-story lookout house overlooks the scenic valleys of the White River and Huckleberry Creek, but you're not here for an informative tourist guide. You probably don't care about the frankly fascinating history of the lookout and how it was used as part of the aircraft warning service during World War II, watching for enemy planes. No, you're here because something much darker lurks inside the Suntop Fire Lookout. And even though it appears to be a simple one-story tall wooden structure, it certainly is not short on space. SCP-3333 refers to an anomaly that the Foundation discovered inside the Suntop Fire Lookout House. The building's interior is a single square room measuring 14 feet by 14 feet, with large windows on all four sides. When standing inside Suntop Fire Lookout, looking up at the wooden ceiling, one will immediately notice a trap door. No big deal, right? A lot of places have a ceiling entrance to a small crawl space. There's probably nothing behind that trap door, apart from a dusty old attic. There's a latch that maybe once had a padlock there, but not anymore. Opening the trap door will reveal a collapsible ladder. Should anyone be brave or indeed foolish enough to begin to climb, then they'll soon find themselves right back where they started, inside Suntop Fire Lookout. Or so it will seem. The thing about being in a place like the Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest that surrounds Suntop Fire Lookout is that woodland areas are teeming with life. Not just plants and trees, but birds and other animals of the forest. You can never truly be alone in a setting like that. There is always life everywhere around you. 
So when you ascend the ladder and climb right back into the Sun Top Fire Lookout, that is the first most noticeable difference you will find. It may take a while at first, but the nagging absence of something unusually so abundant in a forest will eventually become obvious. It's quiet, far too quiet. No birdsong or the sound of distant calls from woodland critters, just silence all around. Anyone ascending the ladder will find themselves in a copy of Sun Top Fire Lookout's interior, one story higher than the ground level of the small wooden building, with the stairs leading up to the front door getting taller each time to reach up to the higher and higher building. Now you know the SCP Foundation and the types of bizarre interdimensional anomalies that they're used to dealing with. Perhaps SCP-3333 is a mirror dimension, or a plane of existence where sound doesn't travel. It certainly seems to be identical to the Sun Top Fire Lookout, save for the lack of any organic life outside. Of course, it's what you'll find living inside SCP-3333 that you may want to worry about. Climbing higher up the next ladder and through the next trapdoor every time with the same result. You appear at another copy of Sun Top Fire Lookout, each one higher up than the last. What first seemed to be an innocuous, unassuming wooden building is now an endless ascension up into the heavens, towards the unknown in silence, without a shred of plant or animal life outside. As you climb, perhaps you start to think about how much higher these copies go. This might even be the biblical Jacob's Ladder connecting heaven and earth. That would be nice, wouldn't it? If you were gradually climbing your way up to paradise, it might make it worth the trip. But SCP-3333 is nothing that pleasant. You wouldn't be the first to attempt this long climb. When the SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-3333, a research detail set up an on-site base camp to examine this spatial anomaly. Their first exploration involved sending a member of D-Class personnel, designated D-4F-68A, up the ladder. His D number is a hexadecimal code that when translated to text reads O, oh, so we'll call him that for brevity's sake. During the first day's exploration, O was able to climb 184 iterations of SCP-3333, communicating with head researcher Dr. Williams below. On the second day, O could see a pair of figures standing motionless on a nearby ridge, but the pair could not be seen by Dr. Williams and the other researchers at the base camp. Both figures disappeared shortly after O spotted them with the camera he had been issued, and he felt uneasy, almost certain that he saw them point at him. The next day, at the 345th copy of Sun Top Fire Lookout, O's behavior started to noticeably change. Previously, he had been anxious about the long climb, and hadn't questioned directions given to him by Dr. Williams. Now he seemed to speak more casually, resisting instructions, asking Williams to climb back down and even calling her Doc instead of Doctor. O also reported seeing writing on the walls, but there was no evidence of this on his camera. It appeared that something had started to affect him. It was when O reached level 527 that things seemed to change more dramatically. Rather than SCP-3333 continuing upwards, the copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout no longer had a trap door or ladder. They seemed to be arranged side by side in a grid-like pattern. Stepping out of the main doorway, O remarked on the lack of sunlight and a walkway that connected directly to the front door of the next iteration of SCP-3333. O complained about the lack of natural light, and again requested to be allowed back down. Dr. Williams instructed O to use the flashlights he was provided, but they wouldn't activate, and their spare batteries had vanished. O then noticed a sudden movement, and just then his microphone and camera feed went dead almost as if someone had turned them off. It appeared that SCP-3333 had something else lurking up there. Dr. Williams oversaw the second expedition into SCP-3333. This time, members of Mobile Task Force Mod Zero, also known by the codename Characteristic Egg in Spaces, were sent up the ladder. Their ascent through the various copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout were not as eventful as O's, with no signs of mysterious figures or anxious feelings that O seemed to feel as he climbed. When they reached level 527, where the copies of the lookout stopped progressing upwards and spread out in a pattern instead, their lights and equipment all seemed to be in working order. 
However, as the MTF team split up, one by one they encountered some sort of anomaly, or an effect of SCP-3333 that caused each of them to vanish into the dark. Either that, or something took them. These MTF units reappeared confused, and Mod 5, the team's leader Graham Purcell, issued an order to retreat and the entire squad went back down the ladders for several days until they finally reached the base camp again. The members of Mod Zero were adamant they did not wish to climb SCP-3333 again, but Dr. Williams was beginning to understand more of the anomaly's effects. It appeared to cause abrupt changes to people's personalities, along with some sort of phenomenon that caused things to appear and disappear the higher one climbed. Assuming these were the result of a mimetic effect, Dr. Williams dispatched a counter-memetic specialist for the next expedition. This specialist was a blind, deaf, and mute woman known as Annette, or the Null Walker, who communicated via a signaling system embedded in her hand, but was otherwise immune to any mimetic influences. Observed by Dr. Williams and Graham Purcell at base camp, Annette made her way to the top of SCP-3333, reporting that she was aware of someone watching her from outside the copies of Sun Top Fire Lookout. On her body camera, a flicker of motion occurred, something looking through the windows that ducked out of frame when the camera passed in its direction. At the apex of SCP-3333, Annette kept her flashlight off, but reported that she could detect blood, following it to what she assumed was a body. Sounds of movement surrounded her, and as Annette switched on her flashlight, Williams and Purcell saw that it wasn't a body in front of her. Instead, it was a pile of rotting organs, decomposing muscles, and discarded bones. And among the pile was a metal dog tag that read, MTF Mod 5, Graham Purcell. The same man who was sitting next to Dr. Williams at base camp. Well, the same man on the outside, at least. The explanation for everything going on inside SCP-3333, all these strange occurrences and disappearances, finally came in a video sent from Dr. Williams' cell phone. In it, a panicked Williams, covered in blood, was fleeing from something at the top of the recursive stack of SCP-3333. There was no mimetic effect at the apex of the Sun Top Fire lookout copies. Nothing was causing the people that the Foundation sent up to act unlike themselves. They simply weren't themselves anymore. According to her frantic video, Dr. Williams had discovered the truth about what else was hiding within SCP-3333. With just the right amount of vagueness and intrigue, the research team had been drawn in. It was as if they'd been lured in by the lights of an anglerfish, realizing their grim fate only too late. The D-Class O, the MTF team, even Annette had been replaced. An unknown group of entities on the top level of SCP-3333 had been carefully observing them, waiting until they would not be seen to slip in and switch places. These entities had been creating imagined anomalous effects, like O seeing figures that weren't really there, as a way of luring more bodies further up the stack. They wanted the Foundation to keep sending expeditions into SCP-3333 to keep them coming back. The mass of organs, musculature, and bones that Annette had stumbled across revealing the ruse had once belonged to Graham Purcell, before he was replaced. You see, the entities residing in SCP-3333 weren't just copying people. They weren't possessing them or mind-controlling them, or even shape-shifting to steal a person's likeness. They were taking skin. These creatures hollowed out Graham, O, Annette, and the MTF team, pulling out their innards and crawling their way inside filling these fleshy puppets and leaving their internal organs to rot. These hollowed out people became vessels for the entities of SCP-3333 to hide in. The whole thing had been a trap, intentionally exploiting human weaknesses, intrigue, and unanswered questions. You know what they say about curiosity, and these entities used it to bring more potential vessels to the top of SCP-3333. They pretended to be the people who they had replaced, mm. imitating them so the Foundation would send more personnel to explore the tower, increasing their supply of skins. Graham's dog tag had revealed the deception, 
and Dr. Williams had escaped up SCP-3333. The members of the research team that had already been replaced were hot on her tail, determined to catch and hollow her out too. And by the end of her video, they had succeeded. A month later though, a team delivering supplies realized what had happened and the trap door was sealed. Sun Top Fire Lookout was put under permanent guard, but at least 50 personnel were killed or replaced by one of the entities. A new mobile task force, Lambda-1 Maxwell's Demons, was created to hunt down and neutralize any of the entities that had escaped SCP-3333. But it's still unknown how many left the tower and are still out there somewhere waiting to use someone's curiosity about the strange and unknown against them. SCP-1730 is one of the biggest threats the Foundation has ever faced. SCP-1730 does not exist. It was June 5th when the compound was first discovered, a large complex of structures in rural Texas, about 15 kilometers northwest of the Mexican border, located in Big Bend Ranch State Park. It was easily the biggest structure in the area, but there was no record of any such structure ever being built. A massive network of power stations, containment facilities, and research buildings, SCP-1730 looked like it had been abandoned for a long time. The exterior was degraded, but the building was still operating. A power generator had been running for an indeterminate amount of time. Even as the infrastructure degraded, power flickered through the site and fuel leaked frequently, but there was one detail that attracted the attention of SCP brass. SCP-1730 bore identifying markings linking it to Foundation Site-13, a research facility that was marked for construction near Nome, Alaska. But Site-13 had never been built, having been abandoned in the planning stages. So why is it in the middle of Texas, fully constructed and long abandoned? The Foundation needed to know more, and they needed their best to investigate. It was time to call in the Game Wardens. Apollo 3, the mobile task force used to investigate dangerous sites, was brought in, and five elite agents were briefed and sent in. Ross, Houston, Noah, Ohalo, and Vigo. It didn't take long for them to discover that something was very wrong with the site of SCP-1730. The facility was located in the middle of South Texas, but the local flora surrounding it was native to Nome, Alaska. Something had transported a building that shouldn't exist to another place and time. Commander Ross ordered his men to enter, with Houston taking the lead. They discovered that the entry led down a long staircase. They descended slowly, following a strange light that no one could identify, but had a sudden shock when they discovered that the basement of the staircase was missing. The light suddenly stopped, and it became so dark that it was impossible to see what lay beyond the staircase. Upon probing the inky black void at the base of the staircase, they determined it wasn't a fog or shadow. It was a liquid, and it was rising. Ross ordered the men to pull back, but Houston was in too deep. He couldn't break free from the inky black liquid. The men pulled him away and got him free, but his legs were gone. Not ripped off because there was no blood anywhere, smoothly cut off as if they were never there. And as they put Houston down, he stood up on phantom legs. He didn't feel any pain, but everyone could tell something was very wrong with this place. And the messages they started seeing on the wall made clear they weren't the only ones who knew it. What happened to Site-13? Death here. Not my body. Bleed. There had been other people or things inside SCP-1730, and they wanted anyone who entered to know that this was a very dangerous place to be. As they advanced down the hall back toward the entrance, they saw what looked like a person in the distance, but as they approached, it became clear it wasn't another explorer. It was an old, horribly disfigured corpse seemingly attached to the wall, not by chains, but fused to the wall in unnatural ways. At first, the team seemed unconcerned, recognizing the corpse as someone named Zachary. For Fortunately, command back at the base realized this as the effects of some sort of cognito hazard, a mental infection in the base. They uploaded a filter to their helmets and the team recoiled in horror at the sight in front of them. But the horrors were just beginning. They turned around to see a shimmering humanoid entity in the hallway behind them. As it approached, its footsteps distorted the hallway around. It pulled AP-3 Noah toward it without touching him. And as the soldier was pulled into its clutches, his body started to distort. Vigo was next, being grabbed by the arm by a long appendage, and his arm started to change color and distort. But the Foundation sent Apollo 3 and prepared. Houston produced a portable reality anchor, designed to handle reality warping entities. 
and with a flash of red light the creature was revealed. It was a horribly elongated humanoid that only existed for a second before the reality anchor erased it and restored the hallway to its normal state. Vigo would recover, with the strange red color in his arm fading eventually. Noah wasn't so lucky. He was already dead and had been fused into the wall just like the unfortunate corpse. These horrors had been encountered just by trying to return to the entrance, so it was clear the only smart thing to do was to descend further into the facilities and get some answers. As they advanced, not encountering any other supernatural entities, they saw more evidence of the dark things that had occurred in Site 13. The infirmary had been torn apart, a cafeteria had been melted into slag, and a large group of containment cells ended with a section called Olympia Class. But while most of the other cells were standard sized, these were over 100 meters high. What had the Foundation, or whoever ran this place, been keeping in these cells? They would get more answers as they made their way down the hall, where they saw a single television still working and illuminating the hallway. At first the television flickered, but the image soon cleared and the agents were able to see what it was broadcasting. It was the interior of a containment cell, and there was someone in it, and they recognized them as one of the most dangerous beings contained by the SCP Foundation, Bobble the Clown. A predatory supernatural clown that inhabits a children's TV show, Bobble the Clown was broadcast by an unknown source and could only be seen by children under 10. Originally seeming to be a normal kids show about a clown, every episode eventually devolved into the murderous Bobble teaching kids how to do horrible things like arson and torture. The Foundation eventually captured and isolated Bobble's broadcast, but the clown remained hostile and vicious. But not here. As the team talked to the Bobble trapped in the mysterious Site 13, it became clear that this clown was broken by whatever it had experienced. It rambled, it hid from the camera, and it was clearly terrified as it told the team about the horrors of the site, and it seemed to recognize the agents as something familiar, but not completely familiar. It claimed to be able to smell them, and it said they smelled different. As Bobble rambled, on, the agents learned about a man named Emerson who ran the site. Like the Foundation, he was obsessed with containing the strange and dangerous entities in the world. But unlike the Foundation, he didn't just want to protect the world from them, he hated them. The entities in Site 13 didn't even have numbers. Emerson wanted to use them up however he wanted and to dispose of them. It's something Bobble called the Meat Grinder. Entities that outlived their usefulness were taken down below and none were ever heard from again. It was directly counter to every SCP Foundation policy, but this site had clearly been performing these horrible experiments for years. How? And why hadn't anyone heard of it? The team continued to make their way into the facility, but their signals were lost as they entered the cryogenics unit. By the time contact had been restored, they were no longer alone. There were survivors, both agents of the Foundation and survivors of the facility, and they were angry. With no way out and massively outnumbered, they called for backup. Mobile Task Force T5, also known as Samsara, was reserved for the heavy duty missions. They're an elite group of practically immortal cyborgs fashioned from the flesh of a god and equipped with further cybernetic enhancements to eliminate Keter level threats and to protect themselves from cognito hazards. They were sent in through a drainage gate to look for survivors and neutralize whatever lay within. They didn't know what to expect, but they knew one thing no one who had been sent in had come out. It wasn't long before they realized how dangerous this mission would be. As they came across some large gated drainage pipes, they could see at least 20 charred bodies of humanoids pushed up against the gate, some reaching their hands through. Whatever had happened in Site 13, these unfortunate beings had been desperate to escape. As they made their way down the drainage pipe, they could feel it getting hotter, as if they were nearing an energy source. And there was one other odd thing about the pipe. It was draining inward, not out. They made their way into a control room where many of the consoles had been destroyed. Looking through a window, their view was obscured by a mysterious black mass. On the control panels, they could read terms like incinerator and body pit access. They split up trying to find answers, but found many of their accesses blocked by the black mass. As the T5 task force argued over their next move, they were startled by a sudden jolt. The giant mass had started moving. The team watched as the mass spun, revealing a giant turbine, which turned the inky substance into a fine slurry that was then scorched by giant streaks of fire. One of the T5 shot open the glass chamber, allowing the team to get closer and blasting them with a wave of heat. As they descended into the chamber, they could see a massive plant-like structure overhead, which started to shake. Suddenly, thousands of glowing pods were released from the massive plant, and each one lit up and let the team view the chamber more clearly. But it was what was inside the pods that was more disturbing. Each pod had a humanoid shape inside, 
seemingly reaching toward the team until they hit the slurry below and the shadows went dark. The team descended to investigate the slurry when something started to leak out of the walls. Looking at it, they could see something moving within. One of the team members picked up the wriggling object out of the black liquid and it took a bite of his hand. It was a leech and there were thousands more of them moving toward the slurry consuming it. And as the leeches ate, they started growing. They seemed to be moving in unison, communicating with a larger being lurking at the base of the slurry. A larger leech, a queen, or something else. The team wasn't sticking around to find out. They beat a hurried escape from the leech room, finding themselves in another hallway. Whatever the black substance was, the entities who had been here had used it, scrawling blood on the walls over and over again. Occasionally, they would come across a drained corpse covered in the black fluid. Had the leeches bled them dry? The facility the was so sprawling that the team knew if they wanted any chance of navigating it safely, they needed to get the lay of the land. They needed to find the control center. The door read stairs to cryonics, and the leeches were nowhere to be found. It seemed like a safe path, but as soon as the team entered, the temperature dropped drastically to well below where it would be safe for a human to survive. The team's internal heating system kicked in to save their lives, but it wasn't the only threat. The team was about to encounter exactly what Site 13 was keeping locked up. As soon as they entered the room, sound ceased to work. The filters in their gear were overloaded, and the team saw warnings around the room. Silence. Don't look. A massive, multi-limbed figure emerged, with each of its 60 arms moving independently. The creature had no head, but a large circular structure covered with ancient glowing symbols. Whatever it was, it was ancient, all-powerful, and deadly. The team scrambled to get away as the glyphs on the creature burned white hot. Anyone who touched it was burned. Anyone who looked too long at it felt their optical implants burn out. The symbols on the creature were indecipherable, but one word was clear and printed in English. Emerson. Site 13 was from another world, another timeline where the SCP Foundation evolved into something horrible. Ruled over by Elliot Emerson, it tortured and captured its beings and eventually killed most of them in the horrors of the incinerators. When an escape threatened to destroy the facility, Emerson successfully activated the device that removed the facility from their world into ours. Of course, as any avid follower of the SCP Foundation will know, there's far more to the story than this. Emerson may have been the start of Site-13's problems, but he was far from the end. It's the mission of the century, a daring rescue into the depths of one of the most dangerous locations in the multiverse, Site-13, otherwise known as SCP-1730. When the impossible Site-13 was first discovered, multiple mobile task forces were sent to plummet's depths and none returned. They were greeted to a labyrinthine nightmare, littered with deadly cognitohazards, escaped SCPs, and mysterious, murderous leeches. Some were trapped along with the civilians they were sent to rescue. Others were killed or changed in unimaginable ways. Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, also known as the Game Wardens, had been sent in on a rescue mission when they encountered a horrifying sight, the captured broadcast of Bobble the Clown, a dangerous SCP known for corrupting and destroying children through its deadly messages. But this bobble was different. Much like everything from Site-13, this bobble came from an entirely different dimension, and he had terrifying information to relay. In the universe where Site-13 originated, the site's psychopathic director, one Elliot Emerson, had struck a deal with the Global Occult Coalition, a controversial government group who intends to protect humanity by killing anomalies rather than containing them. Emerson had converted his site into an unethical, unrestrained slaughterhouse and was incinerating SCPs by the hundred in a so-called body pit. But Emerson's game of death came back and bit him, snapping the threads of reality and turning the entire site into a dimensionally displaced super anomaly. The Game Wardens realized they were in way over their heads. Their chances of surviving this place were dropping by the second, and if they wanted any chance of succeeding in their mission, they needed backup. So Site Command called in MTF Tau-5, aka Samsara. Calling in Samsara for a run-of-the-mill collection mission is like using a bazooka to kill a housefly. But for a case as severe as 1730, their skills were not only nice to have, but vital. Samsara are among the best of the best, immortal cybernetic clones forged from the flesh of a god, equipped with weaponry and technology that could surpass even that of other elite mobile task force units. The four members of Samsara are so adept at what they do, they earned the nickname Power Rangers among their peers. The remaining game wardens knew that with Samsara on the case, they may actually survive this thing after all, and they just needed to hold out. Samsara arrived on site not long after, packing some serious technological heat. 
including arm-mounted incendiary cannons, shock-absorbing leg extensions, heat-resistant plating, and built-in scramble adaptations within their eyes to ward off the deadly cognito hazards. Everyone involved was in for the fight of their lives. The four Samsara agents, Irantu, Nanku, Munru, and Onru, entered via a drainage gate in one of the office buildings above ground and began their descent inside. After observing numerous charred bodies, they deduced that there must have been a massive incinerator somewhere on site. Emerson's incinerator, theorizing that this was connected to the body pit they kept hearing about, they descended further, feeling the temperature rise as they did so. Due to the anomalous nature of 1730, nothing inside made any kind of logical sense. Caused by a reality warping machine known as Thresher, the internal geography of Site 13 was subject to constant shifts. The team then split up to cover more ground. Munro and Nanku continued to follow the pipes and the heat toward the furnace, while Irantu and Onru broke away to explore what lay beyond a weak wall. After busting through the wall, Irantu and Onru explored several empty office blocks before finding their way into a control room with a glass observation deck. While the window was obscured by garbage and human corpses, signage indicated that the incinerator and the body pit were directly below them. The team once again reconvened and managed to activate the incinerator which shredded the mass stuck inside with several large turbines before burning the resulting slurry, the same process that had happened to so many anomalies under Emerson's watch. With the path cleared, Samsara decided to descend via the incinerator, using the drainage pipe as a kind of makeshift tunnel. Eventually, they happened upon the leeches, large, black, and hungry. These creatures seemed to infest 1730 by the thousand. Anywhere that blood or drainage runoff could be found, the leeches could be found too. They didn't appear to have any connection to an anomaly previously secured and contained by the Foundation. They squeezed and wriggled through the cracks in the walls, searching for fresh blood. En route detected that the leeches all moved with a kind of collective purpose, suggesting a telepathic hive mind. Onru was able to tap into this hive mind using her cybernetic enhancements and map the chaotic geography of 1730 through the leech colony's collective knowledge. With this new advantage, they could add a second goal to this rescue mission, find the Thresher device causing all the instability and potentially reduce power to it if possible. But they were on the clock to save the other survivors as those leeches were sure to get hungry for warm blood soon. They followed the leeches down the most direct path toward the survivors. On the way, they encountered a horrifying creature, the many-limbed humanoid nightmare that functions as Emerson's eternal punishment, his charred body tied screaming and alive to the platform where the monster's head should be. They managed to make it past the monster before finally rendezvousing with Captain Hollis of Mobile Task Force Zeta-9, otherwise known as the Mole Rats, as well as the Game Wardens and the other survivors. There were 27 surviving members of Site-13 staff, many of which had severe injuries, making it even harder to transport them back to safety through the hazardous terrain. And to make matters worse, the leeches were back. The team quickly decided that the best route out of here was directly past the Thresher, where they could reduce power to the machine for just long enough to create a stable path of escape. Nanku opened fire on a horde of approaching leeches with a flamethrower, and everyone began running for their lives. It was a final make-or-break dash to safety. However, their advance was soon stopped by a strange roped creature drawing a cognito hazard its meme on the wall with its claws. When the team attempted to engage, it attacked, exposing additional deadly memes and the dangerous effects of its single white eye. And we're not talking about internet memes here. These are symbols and information that are often deadly to even bear witness to. And for you or I, this would be a real threat, but not to a team equipped with goggles containing cognito hazard filter technology. The battle was cut short when the floor collapsed underneath them and the creature was devoured by something even larger and more monstrous, a gigantic black leech covered in huge red eyes. Its entrance caused thousands of leeches to spill out into the hall as the monster screeched and slithered its tentacles after them. Allow us to introduce you to Elijah, also known as the Leech Boy, and a pivotal component of the very existence of SCP-1730. He was a boy with the mind of a toddler, but he had the strange ability to absorb blood through people's skin, hence his nickname, Leech Boy. One of the doctors in Site-13, Dr. Hadley, took pity on Elijah. After all, he didn't choose to be the way he was. Director Emerson didn't share Hadley's sympathy. His orders to exterminate all anomalies included humanoids like Elijah. When Hadley protested, Emerson had her beaten within an inch of her life while other dissenters were shot. 
Dr. Hadley, disgusted by the inhumanity of her superiors, devised the perfect revenge. She sabotaged the incinerator and the body pit, allowing a mass containment breach that flooded the site with deadly anomalies. Young Elijah ended up consuming the slurry of the other shredded anomalies, causing him to mutate into a powerful monster, a behemoth of a leech who gave birth to and controlled all the others. It was Hadley's revenge that caused Emerson to panic and activate Thresher, leading to a rift in reality and the creation of 1730, and by extension, all the problems faced by our heroes today. Samsara and the others fled Leech Boy and began taking a different escape route. However, while en route, they encountered the dreaded Crystal Butterflies, a dangerous SCP capable of destroying organic matter with a mere touch. Iratu stepped up to bat, roasting the creatures with his arm-mounted incinerator and taking extreme damage to his body in the process. But they didn't have time to rest. With the butterflies disposed of, they kept moving, heading toward the Thresher. But not all the SCPs were necessarily working against them. Bobble the Clown came in handy at the next checkpoint, manifesting in the monitor of an electronic door and opening the way through. As they continued on their journey, they had to fight off frequent attacks from leeches, losing some of the task force members in the process. They were also forced to face off against a number of other anomalies in order to survive, such as SCP-2316, manifesting as floating bodies beneath them, and SCP-1370, which used a huge mechanized body to attack the team of survivors. That was all just a warm-up for the true final battle, though. The floor shattered beneath them, and out of an impossibly huge chamber, the monster that had once been Elijah wriggled free, reaching for them with huge tentacles and shrieking from its thousand-toothed maw. It was at least 200 meters tall and barely reacted to any amount of firepower. It seemed like they were all doomed until Captain Hollis had a truly crazy idea. With the help of Samsara, she led the bloodthirsty abomination down through the cryonic center and into an Olympia-class testing chamber. There, as the leech boy was bearing down on them, Hollis opened the gates to two adjacent containment cells and something beyond incredible happened. Two of the most powerful SCPs ever known, a giant sword-wielding gate guardian and the reality-bending cosmic deer, SCP-2845, entered the arena. What followed was one of the most epic showdowns in the history of the SCP Foundation, as the deer and the gate guardian went to battle against the all-devouring leech. While the monsters fought, Hollis ordered her team to get the rest of the survivors to safety. She and Munru of the Samsara team remained behind to prevent any of the anomalies from escaping, as the entire base began sinking into the ground from the combined forces of the battle raging around them and the Thresher's continued onslaught on reality. Even if the survivors escaped, would the anomalous developments inside Site-13 escape and wreak havoc on the world at large? That's when Hollis received a vision, a horrific, charred, post-apocalyptic world roamed by inconceivable powerful entities and nightmare gods. It was a vision so horrific that just seeing it nearly broke her mind. She knew what she had to do, the only way she could truly defeat this terrible place and ensure safety for mankind. While Leech Boy, the Gate Guardian, and the Deer continued their battle for the ages, Hollis ran to Thresher and forced the machine into overdrive. Up above, the remaining members of Samsara, the Mole Rats, and the Game Wardens escorted the survivors to safety. Downstairs, Thresher emitted a blinding white light as the system began overload. In her final moments, all Hollis could do was laugh. Perhaps it was a laugh of pure insanity, of a mind broken by the horror she witnessed. Or perhaps it was a laugh of victory, knowing that in spite of the immense powers all around her, she had won the day. She had saved not only the survivors and her teammates, but possibly all of humanity. And all it cost her was everything. Outside, the survivors had reached a safe distance away when the entirety of Site-13 imploded in a final brilliant flash. When the dust cleared, SCP-1730 was gone. All that was left was an immense crater where the impossible base should have once been. Captain Hollis had done it. Through overloading the Thresher machine, she'd taken this anomaly out of the world the exact same way it had entered. It was torn from its moorings on our Earth and kicked in the infinity of space-time, perhaps never to be seen again, along with everything it contained. SCP-1730 was reclassified to neutralized. Of course, the Foundation would have plenty of other anomalies to pursue soon after, but the nightmare of Emerson's Site-13 was over once and for all. A light shines above a metal table with a chair positioned on either side. This is the isolated, hermetically sealed interview chamber of Provisional Site-23. Outside the room waits two shell-shocked human mobile task force members, another with invisible ghost legs, three powerful cyborgs, and a scientist from another dimension. They're all here to talk about one thing, the nightmare that unfolded at Site-13. 
also known as SCP-1730. Everyone thinks they know the story. A mysterious site suddenly appears in Texas, seeming to exactly match the blueprint for an abandoned site that's supposed to be in Nome, Alaska. What started as a simple anomalous location turned out to be an epic horror from another dimension. The task forces sent in by the Foundation were either massacred or trapped inside, and those who survived reported seeing unspeakable carnage inside the base, including a death machine designed to destroy anomalies. And that's not all. As a result of the mysterious Thresher machine, the entire location had been transformed into a shifting spatial anomaly filled with creatures straight out of a nightmare from giant telepathic leech monsters to huge multi-limbed demigods that would eternally punish the site's murderous director, Elliot Emerson. It was only through the combined might of three different mobile task forces, including the legendary Samsara and the sacrifice of brave Captain Hollis, that the cursed location was finally flung into a different dimension, neutralizing the threat it posed to our reality. But for the SCP Foundation, the story doesn't end with neutralization. There's still plenty more questions that need answering, and that's why today we're going to tell you what they found out after the neutralization of SCP-1730. Not only will we discover what's become of the many people involved, we'll learn about what happened in the last moments before the neutralization took place. And perhaps most importantly of all, for the sake of our universe, we'll find out how Site-13 came into existence and how Site Director Emerson went down such a dark path. It's time to get some answers. Welcome to the final part of the SCP-1730 saga as we close the book on one of the most deadly locations in the Foundation multiverse. First to sit down in the interview chair was Captain Ephraim Ross, leader of the mobile task force Apollo 3, also known as the Game Wardens. He was a shaken man, looking far older than his 35 years, his eyes heavy with the weight of the horrors he'd seen. And he and his team were among the first to venture into the bowels of Site-13 and witness the atrocities that had gone down there, like the body pit full of fleshy slurry or the countless containment chambers that marked their occupants for vivisection and termination. Captain Ross was haunted by the things that happened to his team under his watch as the anomalous transformation of Houston's legs and the nightmarish warping death of Noah at the hands of a stretchy, reality-bending anomaly. He compared the state of chaos going on down there to something like Jurassic Park, where all hell had broken loose and the monsters ruled. He also remarked on the Olympia containment cells, each the size of a football stadium, capable of containing things far beyond the scope of this universe's SCP Foundation. His interviewer was the hard-nosed Dr. Peter Vincent, who thanked Captain Ross for his contributions and called in the next interview subject. Agent Liam Mahalo, a Game Warden's task force member working under Captain Ross. He had a thousand-yard stare, and even the untrained observer could see that Agent Mahalo had left some parts of himself back in Site-13. When Dr. Vincent attempted to interview him, he mostly remained silent, only volunteering one grim statement. We should have died in there. This isn't real. This isn't real. We were supposed to die in there. Next to be interviewed was Captain Irantu of Mobile Task Force Tau-5, aka Samsara. His interviewer, Dr. Isha St. Clair, questioned him about the nature of the mission, and the cybernetic soldier was even keeled about the matter. He said that in spite of regrettable losses of life, he was still satisfied with the outcome of the mission overall. The high-value targets were rescued, the anomaly was for all intents and purposes neutralized, and the degree of loss was actually better than their pre-mission predictions. It seems that the weight of death doesn't weigh quite as heavily on those who will probably never have to experience it, as the Samsara team are capable of simply being rebooted into new bodies if terminated in the field. People like Captain Hollis weren't as lucky. Next, Agent Cotter Houston of the Game Wardens was both interviewed and medically evaluated by Dr. Ian Harris. Agent Houston had his legs dematerialized after he tripped into a rising tide of anomalous liquid, which he described as looking like a moving physical computer glitch. However, in spite of this, Agent Houston is still able to stand and move of his own free will. It seemed to Dr. Harris that Houston's legs were somehow trapped between dimensions. Houston told Dr. Harris that he didn't experience any kind of pain when his legs were removed, but to this day he occasionally feels something furry brushing up against them. Perhaps wherever his legs are, they aren't alone. Next, the stoic Agent Munru of Samsara was interviewed by Captain Elliot O'Neill of Mobile Task Force D-26, also known as Time Cops. Captain O'Neill had a bone to pick with Munru, 
namely that he'd allow Captain Hollis to run off and sacrifice her own life despite having a clear directive to prevent the human task force members from endangering themselves at any cost. Moonroo deflected, claiming that when Hollis separated from the group, he assumed that she ran off with intentions that never included her own demise. O'Neill and the Foundation found this answer unsatisfying and decided to move on to their next interview with Onru, the last person with Captain Hollis before her death. The interviewer, Dr. Darian Arnold, probed the elite Samsara operative on why she turned off her camera before she and Hollis reached the Thresher, the machine that Hollis overloaded to annihilate Site-13 from our dimension. She gave a more compelling answer than Munro. When she and Hollis entered the server room on the way to the Thresher, they encountered what might have been the ultimate cognito hazard. It was a vision of a terrifying alternate dimension with billions dead. A poisoned star like the biblical wormwood fell from the burning sky. A nightmare god like the one torturing Elliot Emerson wandered along the fields of crucified people, covered in deadly cognito hazardous runes. Just looking at it burned the scramble technology out of Moonru's eyes, and she quickly turned off her cameras to avoid potentially frying the brains of mission control. Hollis wasn't so lucky. The things she witnessed broke her sanity, and when she finally overloaded the Thresher machine, she was laughing and crying. Finally, in perhaps the most enlightening debriefing interview of them all, Site Director William Vesterlin interviewed Dr. Muhammad Scott, the highest-ranking researcher of Site-13 and confidant of the now infamous Director Elliot Emerson. The question was simple, just what had happened for Site-13 to become so messed up? And Dr. Scott answered in detail with a tale of corruption, alternate realities, and the perils of unchecked power. In his home dimension, Site-13 was originally created in Nome, Alaska to house the corpse of a giant sea creature that beached itself on the border of India and Bangladesh in 1964. It became the largest and most secretive foundation containment facility in the latter half of the 20th century. However, disaster struck in 1994 when a Marxist extremist used an anomaly to level the Willis Tower in Chicago. As a result, the foundation lost a lot of its funding and international support, leaving it in dire financial straits. Enter the true villain of the Site 13 story. Paul Manafort. If that name sounds familiar to you, it's because he was an associate of President Trump in our universe who got into legal trouble for shady international dealings. However, in Dr. Scott's universe, he was a powerful staffer for President Bob Dole, who in that reality had beaten Bill Clinton in the 1996 presidential election. Manafort was made the new Secretary General of the Global Occult Coalition, the UN's answer to the SCP Foundation, and one of their leading competitors, with an ethos geared toward killing rather than containing anomalies. Manafort and the GOC co-opted the struggling Foundation, providing them with money in exchange for control. The Foundation had no choice but to accept the deal with the devil. Slowly, Manafort replaced the Foundation Old Guard with toadies and loyalists. The Ethics Committee and the O5 Command were dismantled. Dissenters were dragged out of their offices and shot point-blank in the head execution style. Site 13 had originally been directed by Dr. Bright, but Bright was arrested and contained under false pretenses, so Manafort could install a new director, a mid-level researcher by the name of Elliot Emerson. Emerson is often painted as a sadistic monster who took pleasure in torturing anomalies to death and flushing them down the body pit. The reality is both simpler and more grim. Emerson, it turns out, was just an eager yes-man. He was put into his position to follow Manafort's orders to a T, and those orders were simple. Kill. In a perfect example of the banality of evil, Dr. Emerson converted Site-13 into a brutal slaughterhouse, just as his overlords at the GOC had ordered him. But things were quickly getting out of hand, and one of the most vocal critics of the new regime was one of Emerson's old lovers, one Dr. Vera Hadley assistant director of anomalous biology. Dr. Hadley was disgusted by the inhuman acts Emerson was carrying out and couldn't stay silent, and for this she faced horrific consequences. Corrupt guards stripped her and beat her to within an inch of her life in front of her co-workers. In that moment, she swore her revenge. She sabotaged the containment procedures and had the engineers rig the already unstable thresher device to overload. As Emerson watched the anomalies break containment, he began to fear for his life, both from the anomalies themselves and from the punishments of his superiors at the GOC. Dr. Scott revealed that Emerson was no evil mastermind. He was a lapdog for the GOC, a dirty coward all the way to the very end, and he was desperate. He held Dr. Scott at gunpoint and ordered him to activate the Thresher or die, and the rest is history. There would be no redemption for Dr. Scott's former friend, as Emerson ended up chained to the rune-covered platform head of a nightmare god for all eternity. So ends the debriefing of the Site-13 survivors, and closes the book on that terrible place, for now anyway. The story of SCP-1730 is anything but simple, and there are so many angles from which this dark tragedy of cruelty and corruption can be approached, and ultimately, 
It was all for the same two things at the root of every evil, the desire for money and power. But the pursuit of these base desires can lead to some truly nightmarish consequences, and nobody knows this better than former director Elliot Emerson, who will be paying for these sins until the end of time, and perhaps even beyond. Site director Tilda Moose was staring down the barrel of the gun that would cause the apocalypse, and SCP-6000 was pulling back the hammer. Typically, someone as important as the site director of Site-19, the Foundation's largest containment site, would never be put on a mission as risky as accompanying MTF Sigma-3, aka the bibliographers, right into the heart of an active anomaly. But these were extraordinary circumstances, to say the least. Dr. Moose and the operatives of MTF Sigma-3 Fireteam Chicago entered Brazilian airspace in late December of the year 2030. Below them, an ocean of trees, the Amazon rainforest, known to some as the lung of the world, and the lung had a cancer known as SCP-6000. Director Moose could see it on the horizon, beautiful and terrifying, like a huge shimmering scar on the jungle's canopy. It had been identified a few days earlier via live satellite imaging, opening up like a wound in the world's largest rainforest, and it was growing swallowing up and affecting entire areas of land by the kilometer. Not wanting to waste any more time, the Foundation immediately sent in a recon team to gather the first intel on this rapidly developing anomaly. Once inside the affected area, known to the Foundation as the Exclusion Zone, they discovered unprecedented phenomena. The flora and fauna of the rainforest had been altered drastically in the affected areas. Trees appeared to be somehow naturally carved into living bookshelves, their leaves tattooed with words. Huge alien birds soared above the forest with their paper-like wings, also covered in text. Spotted jaguars with six or even eight limbs, like a freakish crossbreeding of animal and insect, lopped through the papery thickets in hunt of word-covered prey. Every living creature in the forest had been transformed by SCP-6000 and it was about to get a whole lot worse. If SCP-6000's exclusion zone continued to expand, not only would the anomalous effects prolong, but they'd increase in their intensity, mutating everything SCP-6000 touched, reaching further and further across the landscape. The Foundation needed to gather all the intel they possibly could on this emerging anomaly before it was too late, but time was beginning to run out. Just as they began to gain traction, the Foundation suddenly lost contact with the initial reconnaissance team. They seemed to have fallen off the map, vanished. This triggered the immediate deployment of subsequent expeditions into the SCP-6000 Exclusion Zone. When the bibliographer's first strike team arrived on the scene of the Exclusion Zone's bizarre alien world in search of the missing reconnaissance team, they found the most strange and damning discovery yet. A creature who would soon come to be known as SCP-6000-A. Much like the Exclusion Zone itself, she was both terrifying and beautiful. Half-maiden, half-monster, a sleeping woman with skin covered in scales, her legs replaced by the huge coiling tail of a python. She was reminiscent of the mythical Nagas or Gorgons, and thankfully for all the MTF members in attendance, she was already in a sort of unconscious state when they happened upon her. Perhaps even more bizarre than the creature herself was the question of what on earth had been going on around her. She was found at the base of a mutated tree, already halfway transformed into a bookcase. There were several large stones placed in the circle around her, each one covered in thaumaturgic symbols, written in what was presumably human blood, as though some strange ritual had recently been performed. But the most notable detail of all was the fact that she was surrounded by twelve corpses. Though they remain unidentified to this day, there is one thing about the corpses that was clear. They were all wearing dark robes. It didn't take the Foundation's brightest minds to calculate the connection. Figures in robes performing strange rituals, anomalous creatures everywhere, the sudden appearance of a multitude of anomalous books, and a decidedly serpentine entity. This had to be somehow related to the Serpent's Hand, an infamous group of interest that takes a hard stance on defying the Foundation's secrecy and revealing the truth about anomalies to the world. While still comatose, SCP-6000-A was secured and taken back to be contained in Facility 57, 
while Sigma-3 Fireteam Chicago suited up and prepared for their first trip into the exclusion zone. Among them, of course, was Site-19 Director Tilda Moose. So let's answer the big question on everyone's mind right now. Why send someone as important as a site director into a potentially hazardous environment where an entire reconnaissance team had already gone missing and the Serpent's Hand were believed to still be operating? Because nobody at the Foundation understands the Serpent's Hand quite like Director Moose. After all, in another life before joining the SCP Foundation, she worked with them. To the Foundation, cooperative ex-GOI members are worth their weight in gold. And in a situation like this, nobody could possibly be more valuable than Director Moose. She knew the way, and we mean that literally. All signs pointed to SCP-6000 being the largest and most unstable Class W gateway that the Foundation has ever discovered. But you might be more familiar with the concept of Class W gateways when they're referred to simply as the Ways. The entrances into and out of the Wanderer's Library. The legendary extra-dimensional location that exists as a nexus between various realities that has become a kind of unofficial headquarters for the Serpent's Hand. Director Moose had used the ways before to enter and gain access to the Wanderer's Library back when she was one of the Hands, but even she admitted that she'd never seen anything quite like SCP-6000. When they touched down and Director Moose first saw the environment around them, the shelves, the books, the pages, the text, she felt a powerful sense of deja vu. It was just like the library, but something was wrong. The way here was not a standard dimensional doorway, it was more like a kind of open wound, and the Wanderer's Library was spilling out of it and into our world. Given the raw cosmic power of the library, it was bound to twist our world into its own image, not the other way around. There was only one thing to do from here. With Director Moose leading at the head, they would use this vast new way to travel into the heart of the Wanderer's Library itself and search for answers. After all, the library is said to contain all knowledge across the multiverse, so presumably it would grant them the solution they needed to the SCP-6000 dilemma they were faced with. But getting answers from the library, especially if you work for the SCP Foundation, is easier said than done. As Fireteam Chicago made their way further into SCP-6000, they reached an area that Director Moose could at least recognize as the true Wanderer's Library. The dirt gave way to wood paneling beneath their feet. The air shimmered like an oil slick. Mutated trees gave way to giant empty bookcases, like they were witnessing the birth of a new expansion. As soon as they arrived and began venturing through the labyrinthian corridors of the Wanderer's Library, the library's inhabitants took notice. Surprised that the library has some permanent residents? Don't be. After all, you can hardly have a library without librarians. As only people with experience like Director Moose know, the Wanderer's Library has an enormous contingent of creatures known as librarians and archivists permanently wandering their halls, arranging the books, and protecting the location from threats. Threats like Fireteam Chicago. The team had their weapons at the ready when they first saw the creatures appearing all around them. Director Moose noticed a giant red millipede skittering around the hall past them, an archivist. It didn't appear actively threatening, but its presence already was a bad sign. Then a feminine hissing voice rang out through the air. It said, I see your intentions. Be gone. Something about it communicated a dark and infinite power. And with that, more nightmarish librarians entered the scene. Huge, spider-like beings with countless limbs. Class 3 librarians began crawling down the bookcases towards them. But there was something different about these creatures. Something even worse. They were wearing the uniform of the reconnaissance team. In fact, once upon a time, they were the reconnaissance team. But their stories had taken a drastic turn since they got involved with SCP-6000. Something the rest of the world would soon be able to relate to. Just seeing this terrified moose. It wasn't unheard of for the library to transform people into librarians, but that was typically a punishment reserved for people who commit only the gravest offenses against the anomaly. What had caused the Wanderer's Library to become so actively aggressive? They didn't have time to think about it because things were getting worse. 
As the Class 3 librarians reached the bottom of the bookcase, they began to give chase, leading to Fireteam Chicago desperately fleeing the scene. But they weren't fast enough. The creatures began to attack, tackling and slaughtering members of the team. The survivors fired back, but this led to even more aggression from the librarians. Soon, a group of Class 2 librarians, giant hooded beings wielding lanterns, began to join the chase. What started as a highly organized mission soon became a massacre. The Foundation operatives were hopelessly outnumbered by the library's legion of obedient monsters. They could not fight and win. It was unlike anything they'd ever seen before. Director Moose was lucky to escape with her life, and in response to the newly assessed severity of the SCP-6000 threat, a wider barrage of containment methods, known as Project Fusilade, was initiated. This meant making Facility 57 the official containment site of SCP-6000. This also resulted in the deployment of active arrest warrants put on all active Serpent's Hand cells, as well as giving MTF Sigma-3 blanket permissions to aggressively use any means of force against the Wanderer's Library's growing aggression. But trouble was already brewing back at Facility 57. SCP-6000-A had awakened, an attempt to attack the Foundation personnel around it. When it, or rather, she, was safely recontained, Director Moose volunteered to interview her firsthand. She hoped that the creature might at least have some information about what was going on with SCP-6000. When the interrogation began, 6000-A referred to Director Moose as a jailer, the serpent's hand expression for members of the SCP Foundation. From this, Moose could easily recognize that 6000-A had once been a member of the hand, a human too, but she'd been changed into her current form by a far more powerful being, the serpent the great entity that rules the Wanderer's Library and the very namesake of the Serpent's Hand. A being as old as the universe, the queen of all knowledge, and a kind of god in her own right. In a sense, Director Moose had a standing grudge with the Serpent. Back when she was a member of the Hand, Moose was thirsty for knowledge. She craved stories, but always frustrated by the fact that they had to end. She stole sacred texts from the archive of the Wanderer's Library and ensured that she would never truly be welcome again. As the interview ended, 6000-A promised to continue looking through the stories of the library, hoping that the answer to their struggles would perhaps be hidden within. Meanwhile, as SCP-6000 continued its aggressive expansion through the Amazon, mutating and consuming more land, the efforts of Project Fusilade subsequently escalated as well. In one of the largest coordinated efforts in Foundation history, Operation Black Star, mobile task forces on every continent conducted a simultaneous raid on every single known Serpent's Hand hotspot worldwide. And they found nothing. Every single base was empty. All over the world, not a single member of the Serpent's Hand could be found. It was roundly concluded that they'd all return through the world's various ways into the Wanderer's Library, like a mothership that was calling them all home. The Serpent's Hand, the only people who might have known what was coming, were escaping the planet. As far as bad signs go, this was probably the worst one possible. The proverbial rats fleeing the ship. And if the library wanted its servants to leave the Earth, it stood to reason that the Serpent had something horrible planned for everyone and everything left on it. Not long after this, Director Moose decided to deliver a grim statement to the O5 Council about SCP-6000, informing them of the gravity of this new situation. I don't know what precipitated this, but if the libraries turned against humanity, the situation is going to be dire. It's a completely alien entity to us. We can't even begin to understand why it is or does the thing it does. Hell, we don't even know if there's a rhyme or reason to anything. Most Foundation personnel only know of the library in the abstract, but I and a handful of others have actually stepped foot in the shelves and we can tell you that it is humanity's greatest blessing and its greatest threat all at the same time. Imagine how much history has been influenced by people getting into the library and bringing back knowledge they would otherwise never have had. Now imagine if the source of all knowledge in the universe turns on us. I don't see this story having a happy ending. In spite of her grim prognosis, Director Moose couldn't give up. In fact, she was relieved of her duties as Site-19 Director in order to pursue the SCP-6000 case and subvert the library apocalypse full-time. 
seeing as it seems she was the only high-ranking member of Foundation personnel who truly understood what was going on. She and the rest of the Project Fusillade Incident Committee scrambled to find ways to destroy SCP-6000, or at least put a halt to its rampant growth. They sent in legions of mobile task forces with flame and heat-based weaponry, trying to burn down all of the mutated trees. However, the trees showed an almost complete resistance to this method, with burnt matter quickly regenerating after the fact. In an even more savage act of war against the Wanderer's Library itself, they fired a high-yield explosive into the mouth of SCP-6000. However, the second the bomb passed the threshold into the library, its effects were immediately nullified. These concerning developments led to Moose and her team finally pulling out the big gun. Literally, the biggest gun there is. The Arturus Array. A giant satellite-mounted laser cannon, only called in for the most dire situations due to its huge potential for collateral damage. However, when they fired the array's beam down onto SCP-6000 at full power, it remained utterly unaffected. These were just three of the 34 different failed attempts by Project Fusillade to put an end to the library's rampage before it could keep expanding, and eventually destroy the Earth. In a fit of desperation, Moose returned once again to SCP-6000-A, hoping she would have more answers. They needed a miracle to stop this thing from becoming an XK-class scenario. At first, the imprisoned Snake Woman was cryptic. Instead of giving Moose useful information, she told her the true origin of the Serpent's Hand. They were once a cult devoted to the Serpent herself, warriors on behalf of Knowledge Incarnate. The modern Serpent's Hand, which claims to be comparatively secular, is little more than a shadow of what it used to be. But they still perform the same basic task, destroying secrecy and advancing knowledge. As Moose's patience wore thin, she asked the snake whether she had any specific stories about how the Foundation could beat a library gone mad, but the snake told her there were no such stories. She did, however, surrender one vital piece of information, saying, All the stories I see with the Foundation staring down the end of the world, they have the book burners by their side. I suppose there's something to say there. Rivals allying themselves against a threat greater than either could imagine. Smoking ash, a fusillade of fire against a wall of trees. There it was, Fusillade, the namesake of Moose's project against SCP-6000, which the snake would have no way of knowing about. This was it. This was the one narrative thread that could lead them to their salvation. But there was one other deal that caught Moose's well-trained eye as well the book burners. Better known to the SCP Foundation and to you as the Global Occult Coalition, one of the Foundation's most bitter rivals in the field of combating the strange. But this time, would it be worth putting aside their differences to face the greatest threat in their shared history? Could the Foundation and the GOC together be the fusillade that holds back the library's terrifying advance once and for all? The O5 Council held a vote on whether the Foundation should get the GOC involved. After much deliberation, the motion was approved by a narrow three-vote margin. An emergency envoy from the Foundation was immediately sent to GOC headquarters in Germany to invite them to become a part of Project Fusillade and stop SCP-6000 expansion before it was too late. After comprehending the full scope of the situation and finally coming to understand just how incredibly dangerous SCP-6000 was, the leaders of the GOC approved this historic high-level partnership. GOC Physics, Psyche, and Ptolemy Division personnel were transported to Facility 57 for briefing on the developing situation. If they were lucky, they weren't too late to stop this XK-class end-of-the-world scenario from unfolding into completion. Interestingly, the GOC, prior to the SCP-6000 incident, had actually conducted more successful raids into the Wanderer's Library than even the Foundation had. So it was natural that, soon after they became officially involved, the O5 Council and GOC Command authorized another mission into the library, with GOC Strike Team 9842 Probable Cause, codenamed Harbor, in order to discover more about the situation from within. Director Moose and one of her closest associates, Agent Adam McMillan, another former Serpent's Hand turned Foundation agent, would instruct the team via live video and audio link. Supplied with state-of-the-art GOC and Foundation equipment, the Harbor team entered the exclusion zone. They couldn't help but remark on the extraordinary sights before them. A shimmering technicolor fantasy filled with trees halfway transformed into bookcases. 
but strangely, all of the books within them were utterly blank. Following the instructions delivered by Moose and Macmillan, the harbor team advanced further until they found an area where the forest properly converged into the library itself. Much like Fire Team Chicago had been, the harbor strike team was baffled to find that this new, expanding wing of the library didn't seem to have any books inside its endless bookcases. The team remained discreet as roving librarians patrolled the halls and skittered about high above them. Security in the Wanderer's Library had grown exponentially. Eventually, Harbor found the first book of the new wing, a slim volume entitled simply, In Progress, much like SCP-6000's takeover of the world outside. But before they could relay the knowledge within the book back to Moose and Macmillan, the voice of the Serpent herself once again sounded. She asked the two members of the Harbor Strike Team why they were there, and when they claimed to simply be following orders from their commanders, the all-powerful knowledge deity accused them of lying. The Strike Team members trembled in fear. Moments later, the two operatives were claimed by the library, much like the SCP Foundation recon team before them. The signal link between Harbor and Command was severed. They were gone. The Foundation and the GOC's first joint venture against SCP-6000 had been useless, but that wasn't the worst part. The library's unprecedented counterattack was about to ruin everything that the two groups had been trying to achieve over their entire existence. SCP-6000 began putting out radio signals, but it wasn't just 6000 itself. Every single abandoned Serpent's Hand cell all over the globe suddenly began transmitting and boosting the signal as well. It was too big and too coordinated for even the combined efforts of the Foundation and the Coalition to get a handle on. The signal was the voice of the Serpent herself, hissing, the garden is the Serpent's place. And a lot of people heard it. Governments, organizations, and individuals all over the world picked up the signal and its ultimate source, the Amazon rainforest. As millions of people began to turn their attention to the Amazon, their eyes were drawn to one thing. SCP-6000 and its enormous shimmering oil slick expanding out over the canopy. Too big now for the Foundation and the GOC to keep under wraps anymore. The internet blew up with millions of posts and messages across every platform imaginable. Even the Foundation's web crawler was utterly overwhelmed. One forum poster said, You guys see the pictures coming out of Brazil? MSN's probably gonna get a hold of it by tomorrow and suppress the story, but it's insane. I have no clue what the hell is going on in the Amazon, but the pictures make it look like some sort of oil slick. It's kind of beautiful. Another commented, Yep, turns out I'm not nuts. My friends have been hearing it on their car radios and hams too. A woman's voice, sort of nasally, repeating numbers, coordinates, I think. And the words, the garden is the serpent's place. Sounds biblical, maybe a passphrase of some sort? Now here's the kicker. If you look on Google Earth or anything for the coordinates, everything's fine, it doesn't show anything out of the ordinary. But if you use a backdoor to get into the wildlife observation camera scattered around, the cameras went offline immediately after, but I managed to save this image. Starting to think I should go down there. This could be big. But random people on the internet were just the tip of the iceberg. It didn't take long for all the classified information about SCP-6000 to fall into the hands of a number of mainstream media outlets. The Wall Street Journal ran it with the headline, The Amazon Anomaly. Not long after, The Guardian released Brazil Under Lockdown, as the efforts of the Foundation and the GOC to keep a lid on things started to look more like a military coup than a routine quarantine effort. The horrors started to snowball. News about the strange activity in the Amazon led to a massive influx of tourists and amateur investigators attempting to gain access. While the Foundation and the GOC did what they could to hold people off and provide amnestics to those who were actually exposed, it wasn't enough. The cat was out of the bag, and now any attempts to cover up what had already been released felt like just another element of the conspiracy. Knowledge was spreading fast, and in trying to cover it up, both the Foundation and the GOC risked exposing even their own existences to the public in the process. The Serpent's plan had been working perfectly, it seemed. But this was more than a mere compromise of informational security. The increased global knowledge of SCP-6000 seemed to massively increase its expansion, as though it fed on people's knowledge of it. The exclusion zone grew by a terrifying six kilometers, and the mutations within its boundaries only seemed to intensify. Things that had gotten so severe that the Coalition's nuclear resources were being considered as a response to SCP-6000's aggression. Not long after this, 
Director Moose's closest confidant within Project Fusillade, Agent McMillan, disappeared. Security footage of Facility 57 showed him performing a thaumaturgic ritual circle, similar to the one that had produced SCP-6000-A. The cameras captured an intense flash of light from the circle, and afterwards, McMillan was gone. He left a note for Director Moose, saying, Sorry, Tilly. I used to spend weeks amongst the library shelves, perusing everything I could come across. It was otherworldly in the most literal sense of the word. I'm sure you understand the feeling. The difference is that you couldn't go in. You made the choice between the library and the foundation. When I first entered, it was just a mission. I experienced something amazing, something well beyond what I thought was ever possible. And I thought it was a shame that we looked at something so magnificent and only worried about how it might hurt us. I can see now that's not the case. The librarians are only hurting people that try to stop the expansion. I have no intention of doing that. This is the end of the story, not the one where we somehow come up with a silver bullet to fix everything. The only thing I can do is change how I feel about it. I just want to sit amongst the shelves and see the false stars again. I think this is my happy ending. Director Moose certainly didn't see it that way. In spite of everything, she was still desperately searching for that elusive silver bullet, the secret to stopping SCP-6000 and reversing the horrific damage it had already wrought. They were the SCP Foundation. They always found a solution. It was just a matter of looking harder for it. She returned once again to her last potential resource on the matter, SCP-6000-A. That cryptic snake woman they'd first discovered in the initial recon missions into SCP-6000. In many ways, SCP-6000-A echoed the sentiments of Agent McMillan. To deny true fate is futile. Just this once, the Foundation had run out of silver bullets. Their end was coming, perfect and inevitable. And it will happen at the hands of the Library and the Serpent. She told Director Moose that you don't get to choose how your stories end, only how you perceive the ending. This story, she says, ends with two people sitting in a room talking, and they vanish into thin air. Tired of the snake woman's cryptic nonsense, Director Moose decided she was wasting her time. Determined, she, alongside the Foundation and the Global Occult Coalition, would find a way to stop this thing. They would end SCP-6000, reverse the damage it had caused, and save the day. Unfortunately, this time, they couldn't. The entire Amazon Basin was quarantined by Project Fusillade, but it didn't matter. SCP-6000 just kept growing and growing and growing. Soon after, a BM-class Broken Masquerade scenario transpired, meaning that the Foundation and the GOC were no longer able to contain the secrets of this anomaly, as more and more of the Western Hemisphere was consumed by SCP-6000. The Anomaly's object class was upgraded from Keter to Apollyon, as GOC Command and the O5 Council realized that the ship had officially sailed on its fight for containment, and for the future of planet Earth. As the Wanderer's Library continued to consume more of the planet in the following days, the priorities of Project Fusillade shifted focus from containing SCP-6000 to getting as many key figures and anomalies as possible off of Earth or out of our dimension. All population centers, GOC bases, and Foundation sites were considered lost. It was over. The Serpent had won. One person who didn't flee with all the others was Director Moose, with the prognosis being that SCP-6000 would consume the entire world in the next two weeks. Moose decided to go down with the ship, spending her last days on a dying Earth with her final prisoner, SCP-6000-A. The Snake Woman tried to comfort Director Moose in the face of the end. She told her that all there really is in life is a collection of stories. One ending is the beginning to countless others. The end of this Earth, this foundation, would simply unravel onto more, splitting like a thread's end into infinite narrative possibilities. If Moose could only accept this, she would not see this as an ending, but as a wonderful new beginning. A possibility for more stories. That's why the library was making all these new empty bookcases. There would soon be an abundance of new knowledge to accommodate and fill its shelves. Still, Moose seemed mournful about what she saw as the end of her story, the end of the world. 
She asked 6000-A whether her attempts to stop everything had been pointless from the start, if this ending had always been set in stone. 6000-A responded, The point was the same thing that it's ever been, to make new stories where there was once nothing. Be happy, Tilda. Your story is going to be remembered forever. How do you think Tilda Moose responded? Did she say, you think people will read about us? Or rather, did she ask, what if I don't want new stories? We'll give you a moment to think about it. Are you ready? The answer is, it doesn't matter. Because regardless of what director Moose said, it would have ended exactly the same way. If this tale teaches you anything, it should be that you really can't choose your ending. You can only choose how you react to it. Director Moose looked up and realized she was no longer inside Facility 57. She was in the Wanderer's Library, staring up at an infinitude of shelves that contained an expanse of books that were both boundless and immeasurable. She was surrounded by people and entities of all shapes and sizes, wearing robes, browsing the new collection, and she recognized all of her old Foundation friends and colleagues among them. Director Moose's story had come to an end, but what she had failed to grasp was that the end didn't just mean death, it meant the start of something new. New worlds, new dimensions, new canons, new anomalies. A vast infinity of stories. And from inside the Wanderer's library, with everyone she'd ever known, she could enjoy them all. The Wanderer's library and the Serpent's Hand hadn't killed her, they had saved her. This was Director Moose's happy ending, and also the ending of SCP-6000. But what if this wasn't the end? What if instead, Tilda Moose had chosen a third option and responded to 6000-A's comment about her story being remembered forever, not with a question, but a statement? Stories on stories. Perhaps if she had answered this way, then she would have been swept away from the world that was dying around them to somewhere new. And not just one world, but many where she could have the chance to see a utopian version of Earth, where anomalies were a part of everyday life, their powers a part of the fabric of society, where disease and suffering had become a thing of the past. She may then have seen alternate versions of her own story, where she remained a member of the Serpent's Hand until the very end, or even another where she was a member of the O5 Council. These were all stories running parallel to hers and ours, real yet untouchable. All she could do was watch these realities, knowing that she'd be unable to help or interact with the people she saw, just as SCP-6000-A had only been able to observe ours. But in the end, that was okay, because there was always another story to move on to. Someone else's story to become invested in, something else incredible to see. Because just like in the Wanderer's Library, the end of one story only means the start of so many others.